Well, today, as Pastor Mark has already mentioned, we get the opportunity to start our new series uh, at the beginning of this year. That's not like our introductory series, and, and that is um, Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, and you might be thinking today, Kyle, why are we starting in Paul's second missionary journey? Doesn't it make sense to begin at his first missionary journey and to that I say, I'm so glad you asked. Um, it's a really hard-hitting question that we're going to unpack today. I'm just kidding. Uh, but the connection to the second missionary journey is actually really fascinating because it is during this one and after that we get to start seeing Paul begin to write letters that would then become the New Testament of our Bible that we have even today. And it's actually during this specific journey, the second missionary journey, where Paul begins, he writes the first and second letters to the church in Thessalonica while he's in Corinth, which is just a few cities away. And so to give a little bit of context or understanding to kind of get a visual even, I want to show a couple maps. Uh, the first is Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, and so if you look uh, on the screen here, or this should be popping up for those watching online, um, you can see that he starts in Antioch, Seleucia, he kind of makes his way around uh, through Cyprus into Lyca, Pamphylia, and kind of makes a little loop-de-loop -loop up there before he comes on his way back to Antioch where he was sent and began. This next image is now his second missionary journey, and so it's a little bit larger, a little bit longer of a trip. He's covering a little bit more area, but you can see he starts uh, in Antioch, kind of works his way up and around through all these different cities that are modern day like uh, Turkey and, and Greece. We get into Greece a little bit to the left. You see Athens, Corinth, Achaia, Thessalonica, all of those are in modern day Greece. But you can see that he stops in Thessalonica, works his way down into Athens, and then Corinth. And it is while he is down there in Corinth that he then writes back to the city in Thessalonica where he just left. And then he makes his way back down around to Jerusalem, back up into Antioch. So, by the time that he starts this second missionary journey, there's a few things that have already been happening to Paul. Uh, one, he was converted, he studied, he preached, and he's already gone out on one missionary journey as it is. But now it was time for him to then go again. But the title for today's sermon is called The Sending Church because it's as we will read very soon, Paul didn't just go on these journeys and didn't go on this trip just because he wanted to. Because he's like, mm, I'm tired of Antioch. Let's go see what Corinth has to offer. It was a, a sending, it was an intentional effort by the church together to send Paul out to do something that was um, beyond just him. And that is something for us that's really important for us to study. Not even, uh, before we even get into like the how-to's, of how to be a practical, like the practical application of how to be a church on mission, there are things within this story and within be the beginning of what we're about to read um, that are important for us to figure out before we even go on our mission and before we figure that out. And so if you could open your Bibles on your phone or with you uh, to the book of Acts, we're going to be in chapter 15. That is the, the, the very beginning of Paul's second journey. And today we're going to be reading from verses 1 to 34. So, but right now it'll be the first few verses. Beginning now at verse 1. It says this. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they, were told, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. All right, so what do we have going on here? This starts, uh, we start this reading by hearing about this questionable teaching that was coming from this group from Judea. 
uh, which is where Jerusalem was. Uh, it was an area that mostly inhabited by the, Israel, the, uh, the Jewish people. Uh, and they were saying that you needed to be circumcised in order to be saved. Now, I don't want to go into the details about what circumcision is. Um, I will let you figure that out and discuss that with your families if you would like to. Um, but what I would like to acknowledge is that this was something that makes sense for this people group. Because this was a custom that was given to Abraham and then handed down from generation to generation that was used as a, a tool for them to be set apart by God, for God, for his purpose. That was the whole reason, that was the whole point of what this act was. And so it would make sense that they would believe this. Even Jesus himself grew up in a Jewish environment. So this is somewhat understandable why they would come to this conclusion. But what this doesn't account for is the, the, the interaction Paul had with Jesus on, his ro- on the road where he was blinded in his conversion moment. It doesn't account for the, the work that Paul and Barnabas had done within their first missionary journey. It's completely ignorant to the fact that God was actually moving in the hearts of the people, the Gentile people, that were taught by Paul and Barnabas. So what did Paul and Barnabas do? Well, they rightfully so go and dispute this bad teaching and they seem to get into a uh, slightly heated discussion. Uh, We can kind of interpret from that to the point where this wasn't something that could have been resolved right then and there. And so what is their decision? What is their, like, what do they, where do they go from there? Well, they decided to actually go to the group of people who had spent the most time with Jesus in person the original apostles, the men that spent three years of their life directly with Jesus, learning everything that they could about what he wanted to teach the rest of the world. They went to these guys because the Christian church was still actually very, very young at this point. There weren't any denominations. There was no separation of churches because of differing beliefs on different issues. Everything was through the known word of God at that point and affirmed by the guys that Jesus had spent day in and day out with. They essentially held kind of like the final authority of what the truth of Jesus's message was. But I want to pay attention to something very specific within this passage itself. It says that Paul and Barnabas, along with some others, were actually appointed. They were chosen to then go to Jerusalem to find an answer for this dispute. They were specifically picked out by the church, by the church in Antioch to go. They didn't go on their own fruition. It wasn't something where it was like they were just kind of tired and they were like, oh, we're gonna take care of this ourselves because we can't make up our mind. It was a communal decision by the church in Antioch as a whole to go and make this choice to send them off. And this concept isn't new. If you look back to the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey, you can see uh, the church in Antioch actually going and sending them out to their first mission itself. That's back in Acts chapter 13. Um, I'm actually going to read that interaction for us right now, verses 1 through 3. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with the Herod, the Tatriarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So the first thing that we see is that this church in Antioch was actually in the process of worshiping God. They were so in tune with the Holy Spirit that they were able to acknowledge the Holy Spirit speaking to them and telling them what to do. We even noticed that they were practicing even different spiritual disciplines. It says they were worshiping and they were fasting. This was something that was important to them. There was prayer involved. And this decision to send Paul and Barnabas wasn't a flippant action There was also this physical connection with the laying on of their hands from the elders and from the rest of the church to Paul and Barnabas. Now, putting putting your hand on somebody is this beautiful thing, and it, it provides an intimacy between you and the person that you may be praying for if they're comfortable with it. But what we see here is this very formal and physical action 
of a blessing while someone is being sent out. It's very intentional. So now as we come back to chapter 15, when Paul and Barnabas go with this group to seek clarification, the church are the ones sending them out. There is time spent to figure out who these people were. And then by the authority of the church in Antioch, these men left. They were chosen and they go. The next thing that we see here is how they were welcomed then by the church in Jerusalem. There's a beautiful example of hospitality that I think we as the church can remember and should remember. They very openly welcomed these other believers and brought them into their church. And once they brought these men in, they shared what they came there to share. They shared their testimony about what God was doing and they wanted to seek that clarity. Now verses five to 21 Uh, We aren't going to read together, but uh, feel free, please read it on your own if you would like to. Uh, But essentially what's happening is these men share their testimony, and Peter hears hears that testimony and agrees that, no, you don't have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Um, He then quotes the prophet Amos, essentially saying that the... um, the people of Israel, after their destruction, will be built back up, but to welcome in the rest of the world with them, essentially saying that these Gentiles were a welcomed part of the family of God after their destruction. So they came to this conclusion and decide not to make it difficult for the Gentiles to be part of this family. And with that, they wanted to acknowledge that there were certain things that might have been normal for them before in their life, before knowing who God was, that they should probably, you know, stay away from. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and continue to read, now starting at verse 22 of chapter 15. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, And Silas, men who are leaders among the church, uh, among the believers, with them, they sent the following letter. So here again, before we read the letter, uh, we see the leadership and the church as a whole sending people to accompany Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch, but now to deliver this conclusion that they came to. And this was an intentional sending from one church to the next. We see the elders of the church working with the rest of the body not operating on their own, but working with the church as a whole to then send these men back to give this encouraging news back to them. It's an intentional process. They wanted men who were leaders to then go to the church and deliver this message. They chose men not just because they were bored or maybe they were retired and had nothing else to do with their life. These were intentional decisions based off of who these men were. So let's continue. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds with what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friend Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they went off by the believers, uh, went off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. So this was the letter uh, that would have been read to these churches, to Antioch, and the rest of Syria and Cilicia. And the great thing about this is that it was meant for comfort, and it was actually received as such. The leadership wanted to acknowledge that the guys that were saying these things about circumcision, they weren't approved, it wasn't right, like it wasn't something that they had sent out uh, and delivered. They also wanted to take the time to build up the men that were sent originally, Paul and Barnabas, 
They wanted to say like, hey, these guys are trustworthy. They risk their lives to serve the Lord. So they are somebody that you should honor and respect. And once that was acknowledged, he then gives those comments of the things to abstain from. It's essentially saying like, hey, we heard these guys were saying stuff. It's not from us. Don't worry about it. Uh, you're doing a great job. But here's some things that you should probably keep in mind moving forward. You know, and that was stuff like eating things uh, that were sacrificed to idols. Uh, it was drinking or consuming blood. Uh, not eating the meat of animals that have died on their own. So maybe there's like an animal that died out in the field. Um, so when you read like, oh, animals that were strangled, like that's kind of weird. Uh, essentially, that's the idea of their blood was not let out from them before consumption. Uh, and then to abstain from sexual immorality. That one seems like a pretty self-explanatory one. So this letter was intended to be an encouragement. And the people felt great and actually very encouraged by what was being said. And the other beautiful thing that we see is that the church in Jerusalem also sent their own guys, Judas and Silas, to then affirm what was being said and that it was in fact true. And it wasn't just because, you know, they were very handsome or had this beautiful, deep, raspy voice, and so they sounded the best delivering the message. No, it was because they had these spiritual gifts. They had these things given to them by the Holy Spirit that God wanted to then use to build up and to encourage his people. And we can read about that. We can read about the use of spiritual gifts and the purpose of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 14, 12. It says, so it is with you, since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, to try to excel in those that build up the church. That's our goal. Our goal is to use our gifts to build up and to encourage the church. And this is what Judas and Silas were trying to accomplish. They knew the gifts that the Spirit had given them, and they were there to exercise those with the people that needed encouragement. Now, once this is done, Judas and Silas take some time to rest, which is good from what I've heard, and before they go back to their home in Jerusalem. Uh, not only is the church in Antioch showing their hospitality, but now we see the, their brothers in, in Christ commissioning them to go back home in peace. Now, I said we were reading to verse 34, but if you look in your Bible, um, there's actually no verse in the slot where 34 would go. Um, some translations do include that. If you read the King James or New King James Bible, I think that's included there. But if you have uh, the NIV or ESV translations of the Bible, you'll notice it just says 34 with like a, a, a letter mark. Um, and essentially, it, this isn't an omission because, you know, the Bible is an untrustworthy source or something that we shouldn't believe in anymore because it's like there's mistranslations or whatever. Um, it's actually because there are um, references, there are, 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 are um, copies of the Bible, manuscripts that go back actually to the fourth century where this verse isn't included. And again, you might be thinking, well, what, what is so controversial about this verse that it would maybe not be included? It essentially just says that Silas decided not to go back to Jerusalem. That's pretty much it. He's like, I like these Antioch people. I'm going to stay here. So it's not very controversial. It doesn't impact the story at all. It doesn't impact what God's trying to communicate to his people in this. And we actually get to read later on evidence that Silas decided to stay. But we'll read about that next week. But what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us today, reading through this story of the beginning of Paul's journey? Not even just that, this, this story of seeking clarification and coming back and forth from one church to another. I think that there are a couple of thoughts that we need to keep in mind when reading about the ancient Christian church in this story and what that means for us. And those thoughts are this, that these churches operated communally and they made an intentional effort to commission people to serve God. They operated communally and they commissioned people to serve God. So what do I mean by they operated communally? What, is that, what does that look like? I think simply put, they understood that they were part of a, a body as a whole. It wasn't just like the church in Antioch versus the church in Jerusalem. It wasn't like Pastor Paul trying to get whatever he wanted or like the elders of the church trying to be like, oh, well, we have this. So we're better than the other, other place. It's, it wasn't anything like that. 
they understood that they were a part of something much greater than themselves. The church in Antioch operated as one body as a whole, but they also completely understood that they were a part of a greater church with other brothers and sisters that they can call family as, as part of the body of Christ. And in this story, that was the church in Jerusalem. We can see this by the way that the church in Antioch sent Judas back to Jerusalem. We can also see this in the way that the church in Jerusalem welcomed Paul and Barnabas into their community, into their body, loved them, served them, gave them food. There was... Uh, this common love and a common mission to serve Christ together and have an understanding of what he would want on this earth. We can also see this in the other way of how there's this group of people who are not sent by the church in Judea, this, this circumcision party that the church in Jerusalem didn't approve of. And here was a group of people that were trying to operate outside of another church, outside of a governing authority and a governing group of men or women or a body of, of believers to send them out to produce this message and to share it with the rest of the world. We can even see that in today's society in churches that seemingly split over trivial matters, things that don't really matter that much. Someone might feel like they don't like the way that a church is being ran, or they think, oh, maybe I can do this better, like I'm better than the pastor, like I, I have a better way of doing things. And so they'll split off and even plant their own church in the same town that they just, of the church they just left. And I say this because I see it. It happens even here in the city of Clovis and in Fresno. It happens all the time. This isn't a unique event. And what I think this stems out of, especially as Americans, is that we have this tendency to lean too heavily on the, on the idea that our faith is just a personal relationship with Jesus. And it is. Our, our faith is a deeply intimate relationship between us and the Lord. Each of you are your own person who is loved and known by God, who he has created intimately and knows well and has given you a specific set of gifts that only you have. We even read about that in Romans uh, 12 verse four where it says, each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function. So there's this acknowledgement that we are different. But I, I would even say, like, let's think about the American culture as a whole. The culture of today in America is all about finding the American dream, or at least it used to be. To pick yourself up by your bootstraps, right? To go and make a name for yourself. We live in a society that is all about self-promotion and self-gratification. There are people who, under the excuse of your faith only being this personal relationship with Jesus... They just show up to church to receive a message and feel good about themselves and then leave, never being connected to the rest of the body. And that is such a shame. And I say that honestly. It is truly a shame that that, that would be the reality of some of us here, even today. Because not only are there more for, there's more for you to be able to learn and grow and experience from the rest of the people here but now we as the church are missing out from receiving and growing and learning from you and your gifts and the way that God has made you. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior of your life, you repent of your sins and you make that declaration of your faith, the Holy Spirit dwells within you and gives you a very specific set of gifts that only he can give you. And these gifts were meant to be shared for the building up and encouragement of the church because you are not just a singular person. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are one within the whole. So let's look at that Romans 12 passage that I quoted already. It says, for just as each of you has one body with many members and these members do not have the same function, right? So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is, if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Or even we can read about this use of our gifts and, and the different aspects of our gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 11. 
Now, each one of the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of those tongues. All of these are the work of the one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. The Holy Spirit has given each and every one of you, as believers in Christ, a gift that was meant to be used. Not on your own, not individually, but in connection to the rest of the members of the body of Christ. Our gifts were not meant to be suppressed, but rather expressed for the glory of God and the building up of his church. So the church was meant to operate communally as a one whole body. But that second thought that we need to keep in mind is that they made an effort to commission people to serve God. Why is that important? Well, I think it's important for us because we see it as something that is important to this church. It was important for them to send people out to do the work of the Lord. And the church as a whole and the leadership of the church made intentional efforts to bless and to send people out as members of the whole body. And I believe that we need to have that same kind of intentionality. You know who does this really, really well? The Mormon church. The Mormon church is really good at intentionally preparing and then sending their people out to go share their word. And this starts even from a, the beginning of a young person's life. The, the Mormon church instills this mindset of sending young men and young women out to go share what they uh, would share their word, share their gospel. And this starts at the training of these young men and women. Before school, they go to their seminary training, right? You'll see cars parked out uh, at the, the Mormon church as they are training their kids before they go off into school all that they can about the Book of Mormon. So that way they would have the answers to the questions people may have while they're at school and while they go out on mission. And then at some point, as this young man or young woman turns 18, uh, they will then be sent out by the church specifically to go on their mission. Back in October, Pastor Mark, Teddy, our new finance director, uh, Mark, Scott, and I went to the Right Now Media Conference in Texas. And the final speaker for this conference was the author and pastor, David Platt. And man, if you ever want to feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, you should listen to this man preach. Uh, I've never felt bad about myself just by being in someone else's presence than watching that man come on stage and start talking. And I was like, man, I'm a terrible Christian. I got so much more I can do to my, to, for myself. But the message that he gave was actually remarkably along these same lines and uh, about being a church, like sending uh, people out on mission. And he gave this example of a, a video that he had seen on social media and it was a video of a young woman who had received her letter from the Mormon church telling her where she was then going to go on her mission. And she's all excited. She's nervous. She's like kind of crying, but it's this nervous excitement that you can see. And in the video, uh, it pans over and you can see her entire family there with her. Moms, her mom, father, brothers and sisters, probably aunts and uncles, grandparents. Everyone is there with the same level of like nervous excitement for her. And then when she begins to read the part of the letter where it says where she is going, you know, she starts crying, but she's like happy and laughing at the same time because she's like finally able to go and she's so excited and her whole family is there around her just as excited. They applaud and they're laughing and they're excited for their daughter to go and serve their God. And what's beautiful about this, it's absolutely amazing is that you see this picture of the entire family coming alongside their daughter and preparing her to go off into the world and to share a false gospel. More often than not, we as Americans care more deeply 
about the practical training or setting up our kids for monetary success in the workforce. And that's not inherently a bad thing. Even the Bible says that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. But if that is not balanced with an equal level of importance, if not greater to their spiritual training, then we aren't actually preparing them to serve God to the best of their ability. The places that your kids and our kids go for work or for school is a great place to send them out intentionally to be an example of Christ. All last year, we talked about what it takes to be a disciple and how to make disciples. And if you are married with kids or you are around kids and have an influence in these young people's lives, well, then you yourself have disciples among you. You have people that you can influence and teach about Jesus to then send them off into the world. Into the world. Another perspective on this is that because we are more concerned about their success in the world, when a young person actually wants to go out on a mission trip of some sort, that is oftentimes met with resistance. And maybe not for like short-term trips, or at least not here at New Hope. Uh, for example, we have our Mexico mission trip coming up very soon, and I've actually been really excited to see the church as a whole come alongside our young people to send them into an environment that they're not used to or maybe not used to to go and try to serve and tell people about who God is. And that's so amazing that we have that opportunity. But as we also know, Pastor Mark uh, spoke about this last week a little bit, and that is um, that these trips realistically aren't for the people that we are going to serve. Realistically, these trips are more for the experience and more for the people who are actually going. To give them some kind of experience that is outside of the normal, outside of their usual experience of day-to-day -day life, so that way they can get to know what it's like to serve God in an uncomfortable environment. And that's also why it's important for us to have long-standing relationships with people as we do these short-term trips, like we do with the church in Mexico that we've partnered with for many years. So that way these short-term trips can still have a longer-lasting impact for, the God's, for God's kingdom. But I've also heard many stories of kids who are maybe considering something longer than just a short-term trip. And the typical thing that I hear met, uh, this, this desire being met with hesitation from the family because it's not so practical. Like, what a bummer. Like, yes, we need to be practical. And we need to teach our kids how to be hard workers, how to earn a living wage and have skills for their life that are practical to their day-to-day -day living. Even Paul himself was a known tent maker and he would go and work in these different cities so that way he can earn an income and not be a burden to the people he was ministering to. So yes, it's important for our kids to have these practical skills. But when our own children or people that we are close to are excited about going and sharing the gospel with people who need to hear it, that should be something that we should be excited about. That should be something that we as the body of Christ get together with an eager excitement, ready to send them off into the world to share with them the one true God and the story of who he is and his love and salvation that he has for us. It is so easy for us to be comfortable with where we're at. It's easy for us to be surrounded by the things that make us feel good. It's even easy for us to not be involved because, you know, the more you get involved, the more you're around people, and that gets messy because people are messy and difficult to be with. But God doesn't want for us to just stay comfortable. That's not what he designed his church to be. We need to see ourselves as more than just the individual. We are part of something much greater than just that. We are a group of people who are meant to operate with a communal mindset and in a communal environment. You and I were specifically designed by God to go and fulfill a specific purpose within his body. We were given our own gifts and our own talents and our own skills to be used as one part of the whole bigger picture and with that, we need to be known as a church that encourages 
and intentionally commissions our people to then go out into the world and use their own gifts that God has given them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the many gifts that you've given us. Holy Spirit, we, we thank you that you have designed us and you have instilled in us ways that we can better serve your people. And so I ask now that if we are unsure or we don't even know, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would stir in our minds and stir in our hearts and allow us to be aware of the way that you've made us, to be aware of the gifts that you've given us so we can then use them to give you glory, to not suppress them, not hold them back, but rather share them with the world and share them with the body that we have even here at New Hope. And so God, I ask that you would help us, that we would be known as a church that loves each other and sends our people out to share your love with the rest of the world. We love you, God, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be in Acts 15 today, if you're looking for somewhere to turn to in, in the Bible. Acts 15, a little bit of Acts 13 as well. Um, but really, I think uh, this morning I just want to celebrate the fact that as Christians together, as a, a church of the Lord, as you know, a church family, that we never disagree and we always, always get along. No, I'm not being naive. Of course, we don't always agree. In fact, the Christian faith is rife with disagreement. Look at the number of denominations that there are in the world, or even just in the US. There's hundreds, if not thousands. In fact, if you look up the number of denominations in the world, then you find a number anywhere from 30, 33,000 to 45,000 which is huge and actually not particularly accurate because when you break that down, it's like a lot of the same denomination. If it happens to be in a different country, then it's counted again as a separate one. So it's not an accurate number. So that, uh, But anyway, it's hundreds, if not thousands, of denominations across the world and potentially hundreds here in the U.S. But the point here is that Christians don't escape the rigors of disagreement. In fact, how many churches get started as a result of the disagreement at another church. There's a story of a Scottish Presbyterian who was once rescued after many years of living alone on a deserted island. When he's picked up, the ship's captain says to him, I thought you were stranded alone. I am, he replied. Then why are there three huts on the beach? Well, the first one is my house, and the second one is the church that I attend. Well, what's the third one, says the captain? Oh, that's my old church. So there is... There is a somewhat culture of disagreement. But to, to what extent? And is this disagreement disabling to the kingdom of God? As Christians, we have many songs that relate to working and walking in unity with each other. And one example is Babby Mason's song, Unity. Here are some of the lyrics from this song. This is what we sing about in the Christian church. Well, let's walk together in unity. That's what we need is more unity. God's people are an army. We're in a war against sin, but a house that is divided is not able to stand. You've got, we've got to ask our Heavenly Father for a change of heart because we can do so much more together than we can do apart. We need unity. Let's walk together in unity. How pleasant it is to dwell in harmony, but how can we walk together unless we agree? We've got to build one another up and stop tearing one another down, so put your hand in mind to turn this world around. And before we begin to blame modern culture for this uh, as being the culprit of kind of splintering of the Christian faith, uh, we have to look at Scripture and realize that this is nothing new. This isn't something that's only related to the modern era. The New Testament illustrates some big disagreements between some early believers. When you read Romans and 1 Corinthians, you discover that the Christians there disagreed with things like eating meat that was offered to idols, in fact, meeting, eat, eating meat at all, or being a vegetarian, or whether or not to observe the Sabbath day, or whether or not to drink wine. In Colossae, the church was torn by controversy over the proper role of angels and how to celebrate the new moon and the proper diet for Christians or spiritual Christians. 
In Thessalonica, this young church was deeply confused about the second coming of Christ. And in Philippi, there was evidently a, a major power struggle between the, within the church, which is why Philippians contains so much strong language about unity. Over and over again in Paul's missions, we see the same thing, the issue of him going to a place, sharing the doctrine of Christ, sharing the gospel of Christ in that place, planting a church, then moving on to a different place to do exactly the same thing, but people coming behind him, the Judaizers who were the people that stemmed from the Jewish people who were in the early church, who felt like that they needed, that the Gentiles needed to do the same thing that they did. They needed to be circumcised. They needed to follow the same diet that they would think. They, did, they felt like they'd been cheated that the Gentiles got to take one step straight into the church without following all the Jewish laws in the process to get there. So there was this false doctrine coming behind him uh, as he was leaving each place. That's why he felt this need to go back and to write letters to them. But I do want to say that very plainly that there are doctrines that Christians have always believed. And these are fundamental and these are foundational issues having to do with the Trinity, having to do with the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, his sinless life, his atoning death and the resurrection, the nature of the Bible as God's inerrant word, salvation by Christ through faith, the certainty of the second coming of Christ, the reality of heaven and of hell, and the promise of eternal life. And often there are slight differences on the precise wordings, and some of the groups have emphasized one doctrine particularly more than the other one, but true Christians have always affirmed these doctrines together in unity. And we can find these things in various ways in the earliest creeds of the church. But these are not the kind of disagreements that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about doctrinal disagreements. These are non-negotiables in our faith. These are the very foundation of our belief. But what I'm looking at today is this, you could refer to it as kind of second-tier disagreements, mostly about the practice of our beliefs, not our beliefs alone. And examining this brings to the front this question of how do you determine God's will in those areas where Christians disagree with each other? Why focus on disagreements at all? It doesn't seem like a very uplifting thing to focus on on a Sunday morning. Well, it just happens to be the next section in Acts that we got to uh, in Acts 15. We started last week, Pastor Kyle started with this sermon series on the second missionary journey of Paul. And they started in Acts 15, so we've just got to the next section in that, which is about this disagreement uh, between Barnabas and Paul. This is part of our Unleashed series for the year. So in Acts 15, starting in verse 36, we read, Sometime later, Paul and Bar said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and he had not continued with them in, uh, with the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Uh, he went through Syria and Cilicia, um, strengthening the churches. So this whole section is entitled Disagreement Between Paul and Barnabas. And this is a good example of an argument between some early believers, not just early believers, these were leadership in the church. But first we need to look back a little bit back in Acts. So we started in 15, so we're going to go back to 13 just for a second because it's really important to understand where this one comment in verse 38, where it comes from. Because it said Paul did not wise to to think, uh, to think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia. So in Acts 13, we can read about that incident, which actually barely seems to qualify as an incident if you read about it in Acts 13, because obviously it was a much bigger deal than we are led to believe through reading Scripture. In Acts 13, first of all, in verse 5, it says John was with them as their helper. So that's where we know that Mark John was with them in the first place. Then later on, in verse 13, from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Didn't read as much of a big deal, really, at the time. It just says John left them and went to Jerusalem. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say John abandoned them. It doesn't say that he found it too hard or that he was being disagreeable and left, or whether he had something else that he needed to attend to that had come up. It just says he left them. And apparently, this was weighing on Paul, because now we read in this uh, that Paul didn't think it was a good idea to take him on the next journey, 
which seemed like an understatement again, because the next part it says they had a sharp disagreement and they parted company. Nothing about reconciliation, they merely parted company, and we apparently can assume that they were mad at each other. Now, it's easy to idolize people in the Bible, to think to ourselves, well, Paul has written so much wisdom and so much guidance and qu that's quoted all the time. It's part of this, this walk as disciples. There's so much of his work that's part of our walk as disciples. Um, and that's true. Paul's writing has become a very in integral part of teaching of Scripture. But here we see a very human and worldly side of Paul and of Barnabas. But before we get into the meat of this disagreement, let's just establish who everybody in this scenario is first. So we have Paul, and if you, you know that Paul has written most of, or a lot of the New Testament, uh, Paul wrote all the letters and epistles, well, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and, then there's, and he's the one on the road to Damascus, struck down blind by Jesus, and then he switched sides from representing uh, the, the leaders of the, church, of the synagogue, and then switching over to the way, the new church and supporting them. Barnabas, on the other hand, was a Levite from Cyprus. His real name was Joseph, but he was called Barnabas because it means son of encouragement, and the, the other apostles felt like he was very encouraging, so they called him that. And Barnabas', Barnabas his name appears 23 times in Acts, and five times in the letters of Paul. So he is really a crucial member of the early church. And John, or Mark, or John Mark, or Mark John, they're all the same people. This is the Mark that's attributed to the Gospel of Mark, and he was also a cousin of Barnabas. And we find this out in Colossians 4.10, where it says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So here we learn the relationship between Barnabas and Mark. So that's where everybody is. And, there, and so on the first mission, mission journey that is outlined earlier on in Acts, we, uh, Mark has been with Paul, and then he leaves him for whatever reason, this obviously stuck with Paul. And in the end, Paul and Barnabas disagreed so sharply that they decided to go their separate ways. Paul had found a replacement for Barnabas. There was a man called Silas. Then they went north together to Asia Minor. Barnabas took John Mark or Mark and sailed to west towards Cyprus. So let's take a look through this passage at a couple of things. First of all, we need to, the first thing we need to look at is how do we discern God's interest in the middle of disagreement? In the midst of a disagreement, what, how do we figure out what God's interest is in this? And then the second thing is, what is the principle of unity in the church? So the first point that we have, and this, this sort of discerning God's interest in disagreement, the first thing that we have to look at and remember is that though we all worship God and trust in Jesus, we don't always agree on everything. The list of denomination proves that point. Just do a Google search for churches around the Fresno Clovis area. We have different churches, different denominations, precisely because we don't see eye to eye on various issues, and some are larger than others. And inside every local church, you'll sometimes find a bewildering variety of opinions. Just as an example, March 10th, 2007, there was an issue of the Daily Journal, and it had an article which was called Church Attire Unfolds. It's all about what people wear when they come to church. And I know everybody agonizes over this every morning. What am I going to wear to church today? I can remember when I was a kid, even though I didn't go to church, I remember seeing people that were going to church. And in the Anglican church, it was a very traditional type thing. People, well, women would wear dresses and sometimes hats. Men would wear suits or blazers and ties when they go to church. Uh, on Easter, people would make even more extra effort uh, but the article quotes various people in various churches of various denominations and of various demographic mixes. And the conclusion that they came to, which was, seemed obvious at the end, was that it, this has become a generational shift. It used to be that the church dressed up for church on Sunday. The expression, your Sunday best, doesn't come from nowhere. But things have changed. On the few occasions that I've spoken at other places, I will make sure that I ask the person that asked me to speak, you know, what's the appropriate dress for that particular group of people before I go there and look completely different. Rick Warren, the previous pastor of Saddleback Church in Southern California, his thing was that he would preach in a Hawaiian shirt. Other pastors wear robes. But the people in the pews increasingly tend towards more casual clothing. I could start a pretty good argument about all this. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Of course, I have some thoughts on this. I'm wearing jeans today. <laughs> it's not a statement. It's just 
my opinion is that it's more important that people come to church, praise God, and worship Him and fellowship together than it is of what they're wearing. So, just wear something. <laughs> so, but these are just my opinions. These are just preferences. These are not doctrinal convictions that I have. Lots of good people view lots of things differently, and they dress differently too. And this is just one example of a much bigger point, that Christians seem to unite around Jesus Christ, which is great, and argue about a lot of other things. The second thing to consider about disagreements is that when it comes to issues of deep personal convictions, then disagreements can become much more deep, much more sharp, when it's about deep personal conviction. Verse 39 tells us that Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement. And in fact, the word that's used in the Greek there, this is, a, this is another understatement in Scripture because the Greek word actually means violent disagreement. This particular Greek word, word has lots of, you know, iterisms. It's like, you know, violent, hostile, angry, sharp, harsh, bitter disagreement. Most modern translations just say disagreed sharply or argued. This was not a conversation where Barnabas just said, well, I think I'd really like to bring uh, Mark with me on this trip. And Paul says, well, I don't think that's a good idea. And Barnabas is like, but he's such a good boy. And then Paul is like, well, you know, he did desert us last time. So let's pray about it together. That was not how this conversation went, according to the Greek version of this. It's not the language that they were using. The verb also is an imperfect tense, which we've talked about a little bit last year, but this imperfect tense idea is it's a continual process. It means that it was unending. It was ongoing. This quarrel didn't have an end to it. It was a deep disagreement with them. They didn't just argue once and let it go. They argued over and over again, and the more they argued, the angrier they got. Barnabas knew that he was right. Paul knew that he was right. Who was right? Well, you could argue both ways. Paul was thinking about the ministry. He had this big picture in mind. He was thinking about the fact that they were about to leave on a missionary trip, and this wasn't going to be easy. This wasn't like just holding a church-wide picnic. They were heading out on a mission, and missionary work back then was exceptionally difficult. Travel alone would be very dangerous and have different sources of danger. They were going to uncharted territory to share the gospel with people that had not heard it before. They were going to mountainous regions. They were going to places that they would face death every day. And on the first missionary journey, the one that Mark had left them on, Paul was stoned and left for dead in, Lyst uh, in Lystra. There was no expectation that this mission journey was going to be any different than the first. They would face opposition. They would face persecution, hardship, and they would potentially face sickness. Paul knew that there was no place for a quitter on a trip like this. So Paul focused on the people that he was trying to reach. He couldn't take the risk of having Mark walk out on him again. He needed somebody that he could 100% rely on for this. So Paul was looking at the ministry. Barnabas, on the other hand, was thinking about the man. We knew that Mark was his cousin, which means for him there were some family issues also to consider. But when Barnabas looked at Mark, he probably would have said to Paul, we serve a God of grace, a God of second chance, a God that never gives up on anybody. Paul, maybe you've written this guy off, but I'm not writing it off because God has not written him off. I believe in him even though he's failed. I want to give him another chance. Barnabas saw the real potential in his younger cousin, who we can only assume had turned away when things got a little rough on the first trip. So he was thinking about the man over the mission. Who do you think is right? And I think who you think is right says a lot about you as a person, not so much what it says in Scripture, because I don't think the Bible clearly tells us who was right or wrong here. But if you're a people-oriented person, then you tend to lean more towards Barnabas, this feeling of like second chances, that God is a God of grace. If you're task-oriented, then you probably side a little bit more with Paul. The mission comes first. But regardless of who was right or wrong, we know that there was this sharp disagreement between these two men. And that leads us to the, th the third point, which is sometimes separation can help. Sometimes it can help. We don't see anything in Scripture that implies there was any kind of reconciliation between these two men at all, that they sat down, they prayed together, and they but it just says they went their separate ways. 
Sometimes in these stories that we read in Scripture, it tells us that there was a reconciliation later, that something happened. They ended up together, prayed together, and things worked out. But I believe that reconciliation should always be the best solution when it comes to disagreements. It should be the default. I also believe that when both parties are willing and they're able to sit down and come to some agreement, that, any, that it's very possible to have reconciliation in most circumstances. Even if this posture is taken that you, know, you have to agree to disagree, then often that works too. However, when that's not possible, if one party is just not willing to sit down and talk about any kind of reconciliation, then separation sometimes is better because disagreement can harbor ongoing resentment. It can end up poisoning a relationship, not just between you and the person that you're disagreeing with, but of people around you as well. And it's important for us to review the biblical teaching on unity. It's kind of... Interesting that Paul, a man who didn't want to take Mark with him, who had a sharp disagreement with Barnabas, writes more about the unity of church than anybody else in the New Testament. Here's some examples of what Paul writes. In Romans 12.10, he says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. In Romans 12.16, he says, Live in harmony with one another. In Ephesians 4.3, he says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In Philippians 2, 2, he says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. And then Colossians 3, 13, Bear with each other and forgive one another. Uh, If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. But Romans 12, 18 is particularly good and relevant in this place because it says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone if it's possible, as far as it depends on you. Because sometimes outward unity is not possible. It's hard for us to admit that, but sometimes separation can ultimately be preferable to this continual ongoing quarreling that goes on, this disagreement that happens. If Paul and Barnabas couldn't agree, then perhaps we can't always agree. The bottom line on this is that the command to unity is always there, but sometimes we have to obey it separately. And with that in mind, this text is helpful because it, it is so completely honest about two men who get into this disagreement. It's interesting that Luke puts this in Acts, and that he decides to include this. He could have just glossed over this whole ugly business, not mentioned it at all. But what happens is the text is honest, and well, it's comforting because it tells us that all the people in the Bible are not perfect. They are not all innocent, as we are. They were people with strong feelings, with strong convictions, as we are. And the caution on this point is that if reconciliation isn't possible and separation becomes inevitable, then it should be done with the utmost respect. We don't have to agree on every detail, but we can disagree without being disagreeable. If there's one mistake that Paul and Barnabas made is that they have gone from this position of strong disagreement and made it too personal. But here's the fourth point, and this is an upside to disagreement. Because sometimes God's God kingdom work is moved along by disagreement. Because let's look at this situation here in Acts 15 for a second. So at the outset of this mission journey there was, that was about to take place, Paul and Barnabas were going to go on this mission journey. Disagreement ensues, and what happens after that? The final picture is that we end up with five men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, which we see at the beginning of 16, he joins them as well, uh, and uh, Barnabas and Mark. Now there's two teams of five people going to two different places. So now the gospel is being spread in more, by more people in more places than was the original plan. And all of that happened as a result of this sharp disagreement between two believers. This is a great illustration of Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And we know all these men have been called according to his purpose. They are following God's instructions. But it doesn't justify anger. It doesn't justify bitterness. But it does illustrate this biblical principle that God is able to make the anger of men into something that will glorify him and further his kingdom. It's interesting if you look at the history of the church, disagreement has actually created some significant growth. Martin Luther never intended necessarily to start a new church. He was just looking to reform the existing church, but the Catholic church booted him out, so he established churches based on the teachings of justification by faith. 
instead of by works. And from that, the church grew massively. Church splits aren't good. They're messy. They are contentious. They evoke a lot of emotion in a lot of people on both sides. But God is able to use these disagreements and advance the gospel and advance people's faith in Christ because God never wastes opportunities. The next thing to remember is that in disagreement is that in Christ, our ultimate goal should be the eventual reconciliation and the restoring of relationships or friendships. Our goal should always be reconciliation and restoring of relationships. This one doesn't always come easy. And we've all been on both sides of the fence. We've been the one that's offended people. We've also been on the, on the other side of it where somebody has offended us. So let's go back uh, to Acts 15 and 16. So the argument is over. Nothing more needs to be said. Both men are angry and hurt, and we assume they're just frustrated. There's nothing left to do but go their separate ways. So Paul goes north, Barnabas goes west, and they separate. As far as we know, they don't meet again for years. Time passes, tempers cool down a bit, new perspective comes along, and we begin to see things in a different light over time. And the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does, and it begins to heal. And so we push the clock forward about 10 years. How does Paul feel about Barnabas now, 10 years down the road? Well, we do have one hint. In 1 Corinthians 9, 6, he mentions Barnabas as a fellow apostle and a fellow worker in the cause of Jesus Christ. 10 years pass from the time of the argument, and now Paul is able to look at Barnabas and describe him as my friend, my co-worker, my fellow apostle, my partner. Something had happened to bring about this kind of reconciliation between Barnabas and Paul. Now, Paul thought Mark was a quitter. Did he ever change his opinion? Well, there's a couple of passages in Scripture that help us to answer that question. About 15 years has passed, and Paul is imprisoned in Rome, and it's at the end of his letter to the Colossians that he adds these telling words. And we've already looked at this particular passage, Colossians 4.10, when we were figuring out that Barnabas and, and Mark were related. But again, it says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus and sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of, Bar of Barnabas. Uh, Mark and Paul not only friends, but now that Paul is in prison, who's taking care of him? The quitter Mark. Three more years pass. Paul is in jail for the last time, and soon he'll be put to death. And from his prison cell in Rome, he writes to his young friend Timothy. We looked at the letters of Timothy last year, and these are the last recorded words in Scripture that Paul writes. And in 2 Timothy 4, Paul writes about the fact that so many people have left him, that Demas has forsaken him, that Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus has gone to Dalmatia. And in 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. This is in the last days that Paul had, and he wanted Mark by his side in his ministry. Quite a turnaround from the earlier opinion. He didn't want anything to do with him before because he thought he was a loser, but now at the end of his life, Paul says, bring him to me, I need him in my ministry because this is what the gospel of Christ can do. Sometimes our disagreements are so deep that we think that we're just going to be separated forever. Because, but because we're still in the family of God, there's always that possibility of reconciliation between us. And because, and with, because um, oh, and Francis Schaeffer, communicated, who communicated the gospel to millions of people, wrote this short book called The Mark of the Christian. And in this book, he argued that love should be the defining mark of the Christian. That's a label that we should wear in all of our relationships with other people. But he also emphasizes the fact that the world is not looking for outward unity necessarily, but it is looking for outward love from Christians. We may disagree on things, and that's okay as long as we love each other. If we disagree, we can disagree agreeably, and in the process, demonstrate that we are still part of God's great family together. And we end up in this situation where we agree to disagree, and if we, even if we end up separating, we must disagree with respect. Plus, we always hold out for that possibility of reconciliation in the future. What will help us with reconciliation in the future? Time is one of the biggest factors in that. Give God time to soften hearts. Give God time to change hearts. We may be, that may mean that we're waiting for months. It may be waiting for years or whatever it is where two people can be brought back together. But time 
doesn't necessarily heal all wounds, but certainly the passing of time can often just change our perspective. We can think differently over a period of time. Eventually, the issues that seem so important just begin to fade into the background. They may have seemed important at the time, but sometimes they don't stay up there in our order of importance of what's going on in our minds. And critically, it's important to not continually bring up past disagreements. If we live in the past, we're always going to be fighting in the past. Eventually, we have to move out of the past and move forward into the present day and then consequently into the future. And This involves some intentional choices to forgive the people who at the time may have hurt us in very deep ways. And it's not easy to do that. But it's easier to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can rise above past hurts. We can discover the true joy of reconciliation because there is true joy in reconciliation. The final point I want to bring into this particular passage is that it's important to hold our convictions in our faith. It's critical, in fact, to hold our convictions in our faith. But we must also be gracious in understanding that God leads different people in different directions, different ways. It's an important truth for all of us as God's family to remember, but Romans 14.5 says that each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. We all have convictions about certain things. If you want to grow a beard, grow a beard. If you feel convicted to do that, and if your wife agrees. <laughs> An education. If you want to homeschool children, homeschool your children. That's great, but be convicted about it. If you want to send them to public school, great, that's good too. If you want to send them to Christian school, do that too. But be convicted about whatever it is, the choices that you make in your life. Have conviction about it. Nothing about this story, though, implies that we shouldn't have convictions. We should. But that's only part of it. Romans 15, 5 and 6 offers the other side of this. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Jesus Christ had. And that's an important, it's an important thing where it says the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. How did Jesus view us? How did Jesus think about us? We should feel the same way about each other. It goes on to say, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God the fa and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God puts a, a lot of value on this idea of Christian unity. We can hold on to our convictions, but doing it in a loving way. After all, our convictions may just change over time. It may just change as we go through our lives. Sometimes what we were so strongly against today may, in fact, be something that we feel very different about in the future. Sometimes, well, we're, we're all different. We have different convictions about different... Praise God, we're all different. But if we don't agree on everything, then that's okay. Sometimes in the family of God, we're going to disagree strongly, and that's okay too. Just not about doctrinal issues. These second-tier disagreements are okay. Occasionally, we're going to disagree to the point we can't even work together anymore, and that's okay too. Sometimes we're going to go our separate ways, and that's okay. Everyone in a town doesn't have to go to the same church, belong to the same denomination, or believe the same way on controversial issues. Not doctrinal issues, but controversial issues. But we have to love one another as a family of God. That's a non-negotiable command of Jesus Christ. No matter how much or how passionately we disagree, we must still love one another. And there are five simple sort of steps for outlining how to discover God's will in doubtful times, in these times when we begin to disagree with other people. So there's five steps. The first step is obvious, pray for guidance. The first thing that we should always do, pray to God. Find guidance from God. The second step is to search the scriptures. If we don't hear what we think we need to hear or that God hasn't, hasn't made it obvious to us, then search the scriptures for his word there because there's so much direction in scripture as well. And then we should seek godly counsel. God puts people in our lives to give us advice through their own experience, to give us insight through him. And step four is to ask God, to give you specific direction, not just a general, be specific. Try and find a very specific direction to go in. And then step five is decide what you believe. What are your convictions and stick to them? But don't grumble when other people don't agree with you. Do what you believe to be right before the Lord and let God worry about the other people. And that brings me back to the question about who was right, Paul or Barnabas. The Bible doesn't really answer that question. And to be honest, maybe that's a good thing. Because so many of life's arguments end up the same way. When it's all over, we're not completely sure who was right and who was wrong anyway. After we study both sides, we can see some points here and some points there. 
But as long as we live in this fallen world, most of our disagreements will end up exactly like that. We don't really know who was right. So let me leave you with this thought. When we go out into this world as a Christian, we can do ministry. We can preach. We can teach. We can give out Bibles or food or clothes or whatever it is, encouragement, whatever it is that somebody needs in that exact moment. But if we do it alone, it's so much harder. It's so much more challenging. It's so much more isolating. Jesus didn't do ministry alone. He surrounded himself with men who eventually would become the pillars of the church. Paul didn't go out on his mission trips alone. Even when his travel companion wasn't an option for him anymore, he found a replacement. He didn't just say, well, fine, I'll go on my own. Because God doesn't intend for us to be on mission alone. We can make a difference as an individual. There's absolutely no doubt about that. But united in Christ, united on a mission, we can become powerful together. The work of the kingdom sometimes honestly seems like this deep ocean. It seems overwhelming at times. There will always be people that are in need. There's always going to be people in unreached parts of the world. There's always going to be the widow, the orphan. There's going to be the sick and the dying, the hungry, the unclothed, the homeless, those stuck in poverty, those stuck in the cycle of addiction. And if we head out alone to take on the world, then it can become very discouraging. We can quickly become overwhelmed. We can quickly begin to see that it's very difficult for us to make a difference on our own. And that's the importance of unity in Christ. We can look past these second-tier disagreements to take on the mission that is described in Matthew 28, 19, to go out to make disciples of Christ, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. David wrote about this in Psalm 133, this idea of the unity together as believers. Psalm 133 says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on, the Mount, on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. It's good and pleasant when God's people live together in unity, work together in unity, and are on mission together in unity of the same doctrine, unifying around Jesus Christ. I'll give the final word to Paul from 1 Corinthians 1. He said, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there will be no divisions among you, but that they may perfectly be united in mind and thought. And again, this relates to how we feel about Jesus, how we see the doctrines of our faith says, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Obviously not. It's all about Christ. Christ is the single source of everything that we do. The evil one divides because the body of Christ divided is a much easier target. But Christ unites. And it's through unity that comes strength and comes results. So if there is disagreement, hold on to your convictions, but hold them in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray to you today that we will see through this story that we have, sometimes, Lord, it's like you bring these stories to mind. They seem fairly innocuous, but there's so much meaning behind them, Lord. And so as we look at our relationships in our life today, we can be unified in one thing, and that is Christ. We can be unified as a church. We can be unified as a body of Christ, Lord. And we just pray that uh, we will overlook all of these minor differences, the second-tier disagreements that we have in our life about how to practice our faith, but focus more on our faith and focus more on our mission. But most of all, Lord, we pray that we will see relationships in our own lives that need some reconciliation, that seem, them, that, that seem like they, have, they need to have some kind of repair. And Lord... We just pray the Holy Spirit will move in us, move in them as we put together opportunities to reconcile. Sometimes relationships go broken for so long, but we know that you have the ability to bring them back together. And it's in you we trust. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
Thank you. All right, well, we are in Acts. We're in the book of Acts. We're focusing this year on this idea of un- being unleashed into the kingdom of God, unleashed to do the work of the kingdom of God, whether it's here locally or whether it's internationally or wherever it is. And we're in Acts 16 because we are looking at the second missionary journey of Paul. We started two weeks ago in 15, we finished up 15 last week, and now we're in 16. We're tagging along with Paul on this second missionary journey. He's, he's tasked with taking the gospel to the Gentiles, but it's not just the Gentiles, because amongst the Gentiles in the other parts of the, of outside of Outside of Israel is also Jewish people as well. There's areas of where Jewish people are mixed in with the Gentile world, and that makes it not quite as straightforward for Paul as it would be otherwise. We didn't talk about these first verses of Acts chapter 16. I didn't have much time to address that. It was originally part of last year's, or last year's, last week's sermon, but uh, we didn't quite get to that. But before I get into the meat of the idea for today, We'll talk about that. And today, the main subject is that we should listen to and follow the Holy Spirit. I mentioned briefly that after there was a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Last week, we talked about this idea of disagreements between between Christians, between believers, and how we sort of handle that. But this disagreement between Paul and Barnabas meant that Paul now was going to take Silas with him and also Timothy on this journey. So at chapter 16, Luke tells us in verse 1, Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews that lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey, so the churches were strengthened in faith and and grew daily in numbers. So it's these little details in Acts that Luke includes. And we talked a little bit about that last week, this idea of this, this you know, disagreement could have been just glossed over, not mentioned very much at all. Was it relevant to what the journey was about? Not particularly, but it certainly gave us something to learn from. But Luke likes to include these little details, and they're interesting. They put some context into the culture at the time. Paul and Silas had started their trip and had been through Syria, they'd been through Cilicia, and they got to Derbe and Lystra, and Timothy was living there. And Timothy had some mixed heritage. His mother was Jewish, his father was Greek. He hadn't been circumcised like all the good Jewish boys had around there, but he did have a good reputation among the church, Uh, And he was described here as a disciple of Christ. And so Paul knew here that there was an opportunity for him to continue to disciple this young man. And so he decided that he would just take him along on this journey with him. But the first thing he did, he circumcised him. Now, there are plenty of places that in the modern day that we go to as missionaries. There's lots of tropical places that are ripe for missionary work. And one of the first things you do before you go on a mission journey is you get some so you get some shots, right? Maybe yellow fever vaccination. It could be typhoid or um, cholera vaccinations, things like that. Maybe some anti-malarial medications. But Paul had slightly more stringent requirements for, uh, for Timothy to come along with him, and that was circumcision. So if anyone is off on a mission trip and you're you're complaining about how you have to take a couple of shots to go on the mission field, then just think about Timothy and think about what he had to do to go with Paul, and that might put it in perspective just a little bit. But this was a significant act, and one that really showed this deep commitment to the mission, this deep commitment to discipleship underneath Paul. But it was also a very strategic move. It would make their ministry much more acceptable to the Jewish people that they were going to come across. Timothy certainly seemed to have been raised in a Jewish faith by his mother, but uh, the circumcision would have had to have been a choice of his father, who was a Gentile. So either his father chose not to do it, or perhaps it was just overlooked. As the culture at the time, it wouldn't be forefront in his mind. Perhaps it was just overlooked, and then it got past the eighth day, which is when it's supposed to be done, and then it just never was. Timothy had every right to a Jewish circumcision. And based on the methods that Paul used when he went to these different places to preach the gospel, 
then it certainly would have been easier when they were dealing with Jewish people in different places that had a major discrimination against the uncircumcised or the Gentiles. Because the first thing that Paul did every time he went to these different cities is that he would go to the synagogue and preach the gospel. That was kind of his center, the first place he would go in these cities. It says in Acts 19, and when he went to Ephesus, it says Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. So they would be much more accepted into the synagogues if Timothy was circumcised. So the idea to take Timothy was not just a random idea. It was a very calculated one. He saw the potential in Timothy, potential that could be used for the advancement of the gospel. And we see this later on as we see and we read the letters to Timothy and we see the, how Timothy evolves as uh, an important part of the church. And this shows us again the importance of mentorship in the Christian faith. We're not meant to do this alone. We're not meant to walk this journey alone. We are meant to learn from those who came before us and in turn teach those, disciple those who come behind us. It says they traveled from town to town and they didn't just preach. It says here that they were delivering the decisions that had been made by the apostles and the elders back in Jerusalem. So two weeks ago, Pastor Carl was talking about how they were sent off by the church, but they were sent with some instructions. Back then there was a lot of confusion in the Gentile world about you know, how much of the Jewish faith should they take on? How many of these Jewish traditions should they take on in order to become part of this new church? And there was some disagreement about that. So what happened was, if we look briefly at Acts 15, it says in Acts 15, verse 28, that it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And then the, the Jewish uh, leadership out, or the Jewish leadership of the church there outlined the different requirements that the Gentiles would have to participate in, but not all of the Jewish traditions. It says in verse 29, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would do well to avoid these things. So this was their instructions. So yes, they were preaching the gospel, but they were also delivering these instructions as well at the same time to these churches. And what happened? It strengthened the churches. It obviously unified them in the message of Christ, and the numbers of believers grew daily. So that's just the first part of that particular chapter. But going on in chapter 16, verse 6 through 10, it says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed Mysia and went down to Troas. And during the night, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, if we take a quick look at the map that we used in the first week, the map that shows this second missionary journey of Paul, and we can see Antioch, and then we can see they headed up north to Antioch, and then across to Derby and Lystra, and then on up to Phrygia and Galatia. And as they were in Mashia, they tried to go into Bithynia at the top of the, uh, top of the map, uh, but they couldn't. Why? Well, it says the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, would not allow them to go. And we don't know exactly what picture appeared to them, but it was a very clear picture that the Holy Spirit uh, did not want them to continue into Bithynia. But somehow the Spirit made it clear to them that they were not to go there. It's interesting, there's a story about a guide who lived in the deserts of Arabia some years ago who never lost his way. He had a reputation, he never lost his way. And what would happen is he would carry with him a homing pigeon that would have a, a very fine cord attached to one of its legs. When he was in doubt as to which path to take, he would simply just release the bird into the air. The pigeon began to quickly strain at the cord to fly in the direction of home, and then he would, that would lead the guide directly home, which is where he wanted to go. Because of this unique practice, they called him the dove man. It was evident, really, that these early missionaries were very sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, like a thread was attached 
that were lead, the Holy Spirit was leading them in such a way that it was very obvious to them. They were very sensitive to it. But the route that they took relied heavily on the direction of the Spirit. It relied heavily on being in prayer so they could understand. It's interesting they call this man in the Arabian desert the dove man because the classic symbol of the Holy Spirit is the dove. Matthew 3, Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out from the water, he went up from the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. So this leads us to this stunning conclusion that Paul and subsequently Silas and Timothy had their own plans when they started out. They obviously had a plan to go to Bithynia, but the Holy Spirit was directing them, and they were in tune enough with the Holy Spirit that they were able to be directed accurately. And this is a great example for us that we have the ability to be led by the Holy Spirit. But how? That's the big question. Well, some background on the Holy Spirit first before we get to that. The Holy Spirit's been around since the very beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. It says in the first chapter of the Bible, the second verse in the Bible, it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we read about the Holy Spirit at the very beginning of the Old Testament. Also throughout the Old Testament, we see the Holy Spirit referenced at different times for different purposes. It says the Spirit came upon certain judges, warriors, and prophets, and it gave them extraordinary powers for extraordinary jobs. Numbers 27, for example, says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take, take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom uh, is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. So here he's described as a man who is in the Spirit. And in Judges, we see different times when the Spirit is described as being in people so they could participate in, in a specific task that God had for them. It gave them the ability to participate in these powers. Uh, for example, in chapter 3 of Judges, Othniel, it says, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. So the children of Israel constantly cried out to the Lord in Judges. Throughout the book of Judges, we see this. They cry out to the Lord because there's an enemy that's against them. The Lord raises up a judge for them. And then he defeats the, leads them to defeat the, en- the enemy. And then there's a period of peace. But then soon they began disobeying the Lord. So the Lord raises up an enemy against them. And then they complain to God. And then he raises up a judge who then leads them to victory. It's this constant cycle we see in judges over and over again. But during this process, we see each of these leaders emerge. And God empow- empowers them with the Holy Spirit. In this case, it was Othniel, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he prevailed. In Judges 6, Gideon starts out by saying to the angel that started to call him, the angel says he will lead Israel out of the hands of the Midianites. And Gideon just says, Pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Not much self-confidence there. In verse 34, we catch up with it, and it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiezrites to follow him. So he goes from hiding in a wine press, challenged by an angel to lead the Israelites to defeat the Midianites. How? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon him, and he prevailed. The story of Samson in Judges. Very familiar, everyone's very familiar with the story of Samson in Judges. But we see Samson is captured and bound by the Philistines. And he, in chapter 15, it says, He is approached, as he approached Lehi, the Philistines came towards him shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. The ropes of his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of the donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. So the Holy Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him and he prevailed in a very spectacular way. And in Numbers, we see the Lord using the Holy Spirit in a slightly different way. In Numbers 11, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to you to the tent of the meeting and they may stand there with you. I I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the Spirit 
that is on you and put it on them, and they will share the burden of the people with you so that they will not have to, you will not have to carry it alone. So here, this is more about the Spirit helping with leadership of the Israelites, spread from one person to multiple people to take the burden off one. The Spirit now is spread amongst others when it comes to the leadership. And we see more occasions when the Holy Spirit provides for different situations. But how do we tap into this? How do we, first of all, hear the Holy Spirit? Because it's all very well saying, you know, we'd listen to the Holy Spirit, and people are like, well, if I can't even hear it, how can I listen to it? How do we hear the Holy Spirit? And in this process of kind of examining this, I want you to think about experiences that have happened in your life in the past. Think about things that have memorable moments in your faith life where invariably these have happened because of the intervention of the Holy Spirit. We just might not have realized it. For example, do you remember a time when you were reading in Scripture and suddenly you understood exactly what it is that was being told to you at that very moment? It might have been something that you've read before that you've just glossed over in the past didn't really see what it was trying to say. Or it could be the first time that you've ever read it, but it suddenly hits you exactly what it is that God's trying to tell you at that moment. I can tell you that the moment that I read chapter 4 of Matthew, the story of Jesus calling his disciples, verses 18 through 22, and I'll quickly read that to you so you know the context. It says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and brother, his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. I'm sure I had read that before, and I'd been flirting with Christianity on and off, but in 2010, when I read that, it hit me, and I knew exactly what it was trying to say to me. Why was it that particular moment? Because right then and there, I was open, I was seeking, and the Holy Spirit knew exactly it was the right time for me to have open eyes to what was being written on the page, and I thought to myself at that point when I read that, enough. If these men in the middle of their work day, in the middle of their job, can drop everything and follow this man, then what excuse do I have? I'll answer all the questions as I go along. They didn't have any questions. But I knew at that exact moment that I needed to follow Jesus. Why? I wasn't sure. I just knew. I was directed and pointed in the right direction by the Holy Spirit, and finally my stubborn self got out of the way. Of course, I had no idea exactly how far the Holy Spirit was going to take this, but it was incredibly loud and clear to me at that precise moment. And that leads me to the first, or the key point, really, about how to hear the Holy Spirit, and that is to get out of the way. We have to remove ourselves from the process. We have to remove our wants, our desires, our needs, our hang-ups, our stubbornness, and be open. Open our minds open our emotions to hear what the Holy Spirit has for us. We cloud our connection with the Holy Spirit all the time. We cloud it with everything that's racing through our minds and our heads and our hearts constantly. So we need to clear the decks, be very open to hearing Him. We also see this in worship. So that's in Scripture. But we also in worship have these experiences in life as well. Musical worship I'm talking about. I know there's different ways to worship God. You can worship him through reading, but musical worship in this circumstances. I don't know if you remember a time when you were worshiping God, musically speaking, in song, whether it was in church or whether it was at a concert, whether it was in your car or your shower, wherever it was, and suddenly you find that there's tears running down your cheek. You feel overwhelmed by his presence. You ex- the, the experience of our faith suddenly takes on a whole different level and I believe that this, at that very moment that we have opened up our hearts and our minds completely to hear God, and he moves in us as the Holy Spirit, and we feel it so deeply. Sometimes it's in prayer, the experiences that we have in prayer. 
we might find ourselves drifting off, almost as if we're going into a trance. We start off with these prayers, but we drift off, and we find ourselves, and I don't mean because we're distracted with something else, but we drift off into these, in these circumstances, almost like we're in a trance, and then we have thoughts, we have ideas, and we have almost answers coming to our minds. It fills our minds, and perhaps it's just an incredible peace that we feel at that moment. It might be a bunch of stuff. It might just be peace that overwhelms us. Something that stops us from talking and moves us into this posture of silence. That's the Holy Spirit. It may be an idea in a sermon that strikes you, and I'm not saying I have the most profound things to say to you, but the Holy Spirit sometimes can elevate these things. The Holy Spirit can sometimes make them more obvious in your mind at some point. When you think to yourself, when you're listening to anybody preach or talk about the Bible, that suddenly you think to yourself, that was exactly what I needed to hear. It's the Holy Spirit helping us to understand. It elevates things. It helps us to become more understanding in our own minds. And soon we begin to take notice of it. Second Timothy three sixteen and 17 says, All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the Holy Spirit here uses all Scripture to teach us, to help us to understand His Word so we can read it and apply it to our own lives. The Holy Spirit also uses Scripture to rebuke us, to show us what we're doing wrong, how we are straying from God's desire for us. But He doesn't just leave us at that point where we know we're wrong because then the Holy Spirit uses Scripture to correct us because we can always get back on track. That's the beauty of grace. It doesn't just leave us in our mess, but allows us to come through that with his grace. And we have to look for the Holy Spirit's guidance to realign ourselves and correct our pathway. The Holy Spirit then uses scripture to train us in righteousness, to help with our walk as disciples of Christ. But in order to hear the Spirit in our lives, we first of all have to get out of the way and clear the noise in our minds and in our hearts. In this day of technology, we're just carpet bombed with things like information and opinions and facts and misinformation. We have more noise than ever in our subconscious mind. I like this quote by C.S. Lewis that says, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become the selves that God wants us to be. Those are, that's ourselves, the true identity. This is a life surrendered to God, a life that's willing to listen to the Spirit, and in turn ends up as a life that promotes God's ministry. So that's the first thing, just like getting out of the way. But I guess hearing the Spirit is a bit more basic than that, because it's, I probably should have put this point first. But first of all, we have to acknowledge that there is a Holy Spirit, right? How are we going to hear something we don't even believe it's there? We have to acknowledge there is a spirit. And unless we acknowledge that to ourselves first, we won't even begin to listen to it. And that involves this process of having a true faith in God, that understanding that God is who he says he is in this word, and also that the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's Lord Jesus Christ that gives us the gift of the Spirit when he physically left us during the ascension. And he said in John 14, and I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. This world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor it knows him, but you know him for he lives in you and will be in you. So until we accept that we have a faith in Christ, then we won't hear what he provides for us, and that is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. But back to our story of Paul and Silas and Timothy. They had a plan, they were on their way, but the door closed for them, and the Spirit moved them away from their intended destination. And this is also like a picture of life as a disciple of Christ. Because how many times do we say, well, I'm going to go and do that? Or more importantly, we say, I'm not going to do that. I will never do that. We've said that many times. First time I met with Pastor Tim, and I've said this before, the first time I met with Pastor Tim after I became a Christian, I said, I'll do anything except children's ministry. 
In other words, I was saying to God, I'm not going to do that. I ended up teaching fifth and sixth, including Wednesday night program. And then I taught in VBS. So things, you have to be careful what you say. Because suddenly the Holy Spirit begins to redirect us and into places that we don't always willingly want to go. But the weird thing is that when we go to these places that we're not expecting or we're not willingly going to go, what happens? It works. It seems like it fits. Why? Because God knows better than any of us what's good for us. God knows better than any of us what we are equipped for, what he has gifted us with. I was listening to a podcast the other day by John Acuff. I don't know if anyone know John Acuff, but he said something that was so important, I had to write it down then and there. But anyway, the context was that he was writing a letter to himself 25 years ago. So he was like, if I was going to write a letter and give advice to myself 25 years ago, what would I write? He was 47, so it would have been his 22-year-old self. So he was a bit of a late starter in life, felt like he wasted too much time before he got fully engaged with what he wanted to do. So he was like, what would I tell myself at 22 that I, don't, that I know now that obviously I didn't know back then? And just on a quick tangent, I was like, I, that really got me thinking after I'd written it down. And then I started thinking about what would I tell my 22-year-old self? It might be more than 25 years ago now, but my 22-year-old self, what would I say to my 22-year-old self? And the only thing I could come up with is the overarching thing that I would say to myself at 22 is accept Jesus Christ now. Don't wait. Don't waste time. Because I've had regret. I accepted Christ at 40 and I've had lots of regrets about the fact that I wasted so much time and I could be so much further ahead now than, than I would be. But then I also began to realize that timing is God's timing and everything that happened up to that point has given me a slightly different perspective. So we're not, I'm not going to argue with God's timing on that. But if I could tell my 22-year-old self something, I would say, accept Jesus Christ now. Don't wait. But anyway, what he said in this podcast, what he said to his 22-year-old self, or one of the things that he said was uh, that he is sitting on a pile of gifts but doesn't know how to open it. At 22, he said he was sitting on a pile of gifts but he didn't know how to open these gifts. And I began thinking about that and I thought, this is like us as Christians, we're sitting on a pile of gifts that God has given us, but we just don't know how to open it. These spiritual gifts, these talents, these skills, but most of all, the Holy Spirit. It's a gift given to us by God, but we don't know how to access it. Because it's a very common question. How do I access the Holy Spirit? But once we focus on how we do that, focus on the Holy Spirit, focusing on listening and understanding those experiences that we have where the Holy Spirit is involved, we just don't realize it, well, then all the other gifts that are given to us by God will begin to unfold and they'll begin to unwrap themselves because we'll have a much more enlightened uh, life as a, and a walk as a Christian. And all these gifts that we have, some of them are already open, some of them we just don't know yet what they are, but they will begin to unravel. They will begin to unfold uh, and sometimes it's things that we don't expect. Sometimes these gifts that we have, we don't, it's not something we expected to have. And this is where we need to be in tune to find out what that is. You can take spiritual gifts online, you can take spiritual gift tests you know, in books, etc. But deep down, we kind of know when we strike on something that works. We know when we hit on something that's in that gift category. And sometimes the only way to do that is just to try different things. But we just know when we do. We just know, it's that expression. I just know. That's how the Spirit works in us. And while we're on the subject of this, we just know, I believe that the Spirit is obvious to us at different times as well. Because you find yourselves in a place sometimes where you think, I'm just not comfortable with this. I'm uneasy about this. It's an uncomfortable situation. I feel like I should not be here, so I need to get myself away from this situation. And I believe that if somebody said to you at that point, well, how did you know? You just say, I just knew. You can call it instinct. You can call it intuition. But if we have this guiding spirit inside of us, why wouldn't it lead us in a way that would create for us this instinctive feeling? When we need to feel it, the Holy Spirit moves in us and allows us to feel it. So listen to it. But the bottom line is that there's been times documented here in Acts. There's been times documented all over the Old Testament, the New Testament, and even in our own lives 
where we see this illustration of the Holy Spirit directing us. And there are times when God just closes the door and opens up another door in a completely different direction. The Lord closed the door for Paul and Silas and Timothy to go to Bithynia, but when they went a different way, they went to Troas, and it was there that Paul had a vision. It was a man standing and begging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. What did Paul do after that vision? Well, it doesn't say that he woke up and he, thought, and he went over to Silas and said, you know, I had a weird dream. We need to go to Macedonia and help people. And Silas is like, I just go to sleep. It's the middle of the night. But he says simply that he got, it says, we got ready to leave for Macedonia. At once, we got ready to leave for Macedonia. And just notice, just a quick side thing here that the pronouns have changed in this now, in Acts. As we're in chapter 16, the pronouns now. Paul, before when he was writing, was saying, they went to Galatia, they went to Troas. Now it says, we got ready at once to leave. So the only conclusion we can draw from that is that Luke was in Troas waiting for them, or he had arranged to meet them there, and now he was going to join them on this journey because now it says we are going to leave. But Paul wasted no time. He said at once. He didn't second guess it. He didn't think to himself, man, I must have eaten some crazy cheese last night because this is a weird dream. (laughs) He knew that that vision was provided to him for a reason, to open the next door after the previous one had been closed. It's often when we're resting and waiting on God, that then these visions, this idea, this sort of direction becomes for the next pathway. And we, as we develop this idea this year of becoming unleashed into the kingdom of God, we also have to be prepared that sometimes we'll have doors slammed in our face. Sometimes a door will close almost at unexpected times sometimes. But we cannot be afraid of that because sometimes it's a bit of a trial and error process. We need to just ask the Lord to give us courage, to give us tenacity, and to give us a certain degree of toughness to overcome these doors that will close in our face. And this helps us to become more and more resilient in our attitude towards the pursuit of God's best best pathway. Because as we realize these things, you know, we have to just not dwell on them. Because when we dwell on closed doors, then it clouds our judgment. We won't follow the direction that we're supposed to go on. But when we, when we do open the right doors, then the Lord will open the hearts of the people in the, through those doors. If you read on a little bit in chapter 16, this is a good example. So in chapter 16, then they go on to Troas. When they left Troas, they went to Philippi, and God opened the heart of Lydia, a wealthy seller of purple royal garments, This conversion really must have given Paul and Timothy a lot of confirmation that they had gone in the right direction, that this vision was a good thing to follow. Because if the Lord is opening people's hearts and minds to the gospel of truth, then we will find joy in it. There will be advancement where we didn't expect to see it. It's very likely that Paul never would have expected God to choose a wealthy woman to be the first convert in Europe. But he remained open to all these possibilities. With that in mind, we should ask God to keep our mind open to the people that we minister to because often it's our own personal preferences, often it's our own expectations, and often it's our own prejudice that can direct us. But the Lord might have very different plans than that. I can tell you there's plenty of people in prison ministry that never would have thought that they would be ministering to people in prison when they first became Christians. I can tell you that Jeff and Cindy Eidson are local missionaries here, which are right here on the second row. That when they first became Christians, they wouldn't have expected that they'd be ministering to gang members now. But sometimes we have to get out of the way Because we can cloud God's plans for us with our own preferences, with our own expectations, and our own prejudice. Sometimes doors close, but other ones open. In 1858, in the Illinois legislature, there was this obscure statute that meant that Stephen A. Douglas was elected to the U.S. Senate instead of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln had won the popular vote. But when a sympathetic friend asked Lincoln how he felt, he said, like a boy who stubbed his toe, I'm too big to cry, but too badly hurt to laugh. Well, uh, that door closed for him. And that was a painful experience for him. That door had closed. However, two years later, he won the presidential election. 
God uses closed doors to open up bigger and better ones for us down the road. Dwelling on closed doors, like I said, it stalls us in our faith because we don't always know where he's taking us. Sometimes it's just the first step on a longer journey. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, they went to Macedonia, but they didn't stop there. That was just the next step. And from that point, they would have to see where the Spirit was going to lead them. Charles Spurgeon once said, to trust God in the light is nothing, but to trust him in the dark, that's faith. When you don't know where you're going next, when you're going into places that you are not necessarily willing to go, but being sensitive to the Holy Spirit is one of the keys to understanding how to be unleashed this year. And it's one of the keys to unwrapping the pile of gifts that God has for us. It's the key to finding the direction that he wants us to go in our life and in our faith. Because when we embrace this side of our faith, when we, then we will find a new boldness, we will find a heart for people that perhaps we've never even considered before, and it'll give us a drive to really make a difference in his kingdom. 2 Timothy 1 says, For the Spirit of God gave us, uh, for the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. It does not make us timid. The Spirit of God does not make us timid, but it gives us power, it gives us love, and it gives us self-discipline to do what we need to do. So we need to get out of the way of the Holy Spirit. We need to silence the noise and hear and feel and act on the Spirit of God. We don't have to kick down doors. He'll open the right doors for us if we know what direction we're going in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for the Holy Spirit. Just give us the open mind, open heart to see what it is that he needs to do in our lives. Give us an open mind in the sense that we need to clear out our own preferences, our own prejudices, to see people for, for who they are, to see people that perhaps we wouldn't have seen before, but the Holy Spirit has led us that direction. Lord, help us to minister to those that need ministry. Help us to go in the direction that perhaps we're not willingly going in, but to find the boldness that, we, that you will give us through the Holy Spirit. Give us the strength. We know you've equipped us. Help us to unwrap those gifts so we can see what equipment we have. Because you know what it is. It just makes us resistant if we don't. Lord, we love you. We are grateful for this spirit that directs us. And we pray in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Um, all right, we're in Acts. Acts 16. That's where we've been. That's where we're at today. And you know, if, you, if you've never read Acts, and you're looking for a place to start reading the Bible, if you're like, I need to start reading more, Acts is a great place to start. It really is. Because after the Gospels, you know, this is the sequel. It's even written by one of the Gospel writers, Luke. So this is the next part. This is the story of how from that point that Jesus is ascended into heaven, that the church begins. And it's a, it's a very epic story. It has so many parts to it. I wish I could just preach all the way through Acts, but we're going to pick specific parts this year uh, to preach about in Acts. But it's such a good book to read, so just I recommend it highly. If you want to read uh, something right now, you're looking for a place to start, Acts 1. Start right there and just read all the way through it. It's well worth doing. It gives you kind of the backbone of the New Testament. Everything stems from Acts. It's like this is the story of the church, all the letters that Paul wrote. It's related to where he went, the different places. It relates to the people that he was with. So this is a great sort of opportunity to see how it all fits together through the New Testament. And Acts is kind of the backbone that everything comes from. Anyway, that's beside the point. But uh, last week we were talking about the Holy Spirit, how uh, we can find a way to practically apply hearing the Holy Spirit, or even how we can even hear it in the first place and apply it to our lives and apply it to the way that we walk the direction that we walk in when it comes to our walk with Christ. We've been in Paul's second missionary journey, and the fact that uh, he, plus the others that, he were, that were with him, are very sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. 
They're very sensitive. It tells them which direction they need to go. It was their responsiveness to this, to this uh, sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that meant that they didn't go to Bithynia, which is where they originally were planning to go. Now they redirected. They went to Troas. And that's where it appeared that Luke, the writer of Acts, joined them at that point. The pronouns went from they did this or them to we or us. So we understand that now Luke is with them. And it was in Troas that Paul had this vision that led them to Macedonia. They stepped foot in what was considered to be Europe. The first person that they saw coming to Christ there in, uh, in Macedonia was Lydia. She was a wealthy seller of purple uh, fabric, of purple cloth. Purple, of course, being the most expensive and more luxurious uh, color of cloth that you could buy. So she was definitely very wealthy when it came to deals in cloth. Royalty would wear purple. That just goes to show how rare it was. But now we catch up in this story with Paul, with Silas, with Timothy, who they picked up along the way. Timothy was a younger man than Paul, and he was going to be discipled by Paul throughout these travels. Uh, and of course, Luke. And they're in Philippi. So they end up in Philippi right now. In the letter, and that relates to the letter that Paul wrote, Philippians. So he was writing to the people of Philippi. But this is the first time he's been to Philippi. And Philippi is described in Acts 16.12 as a Roman colony. It was one of the leading uh, city of the district of Macedonia. Philippi was very important when it came to gold mining. So obviously the Romans had a very vested interest in this. Many of the gold coins were minted in Philippi. So from, a, from that perspective, it was very important to the Romans. Philippi was located in what's now sort of modern-day Greece, Macedonia, over the years, changed its borders. It kind of looked different shapes depending on who was fighting for territory at the time. But the Romans had the biggest section of it when it was during Roman rule. But the portion, uh, so portion of it's in Greece, then five other in modern day countries surrounding that in what we call the Balkans now. Thessalonica was also, like as Thessalonians, you know, he wrote to the people in Thessalonica. That was also in Macedonia. That was another key city, but in a slightly different district of Macedonia. Because Paul knew exactly what he was doing. He was prompted by the Holy Spirit. He was going to the different places, taking the gospel to different places, and he knew what he was doing. He was going to these key cities in order to maximize the efficiency of what he was doing in the church and to maximize the spread of the gospel of Christ. Some scholars also suggested that Luke was from Philippi. Um, there's been different things that have led to that conclusion. He seems to stay there because it stops, it goes back to they uh, after this particular event we're talking about today, but he seems to stay there. He stays there for a few years. We don't see him again until the latter part of the third journey of Paul. It's not confirmed, but people feel like perhaps Luke was from that area. Anyway, chapter 16 of Acts, and we're going to be in verse 16. So 16, 16. It says, once we were going... Or when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and he said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us. Romans to accept or to practice. So they went to this place of prayer, and there, there's this slave girl who is own uh, and their owners who were making money off her by fortune telling. Uh, they, and she began to shout, draw a lot of attention to them. And this went on for quite a long time. It says it went on for many days. And finally, Paul's had enough. He snaps. He's like, okay, I can't do the, deal with this anymore. And yet, if you've had young children, you understand this. Eventually, the noise starts getting to you. But he can't listen to it anymore, so he decides to fix it. He casts out this demon, the evil spirit that was with her, and she stopped yelling about them. Her owners now, though, at that point, realized they couldn't make any more money off her supposed fortune-telling, because we have to understand these are evil spirits. They're not omniscient like God. They don't have the ability to fortune-tell, but whatever it was she was doing was conceived, or could, uh, whatever the word is, um, thought to be... <laughs> Sometimes they just disappear out of your head. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 
But whatever she was doing, it seemed like it was fortune-telling to others, and they were willing to pay for it. But we have to note, so straight away out of this piece of scripture, we have to note that this demonic spirit knows that the presence of these men that are on a mission had the power of God. They, it, it was recognized that they had the power of God with them on this mission journey. The demon shouting was probably done out of mockery. It was certainly not meant to enhance the spread of the gospel, but to disrupt it in some way. And apparently it did, because it was getting to Paul to the point where he needed to fix it. But Luke has already told us about similar situations that Jesus encountered in his gospel in Luke 4. It says, in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit, and he cried out at the top of his voice, go away. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus encountered similar situations later on in Luke 4, in Luke 8, in Mark 1, in Mark 3, in Mark 5. The evil spirits, these demons, know God. They know Jesus. They know these men have been sent on a mission to spread the gospel. So this gives us some insight into our salvation, that it doesn't depend on knowing God and knowing God is God. We can have that knowledge, but our salvation doesn't stem from knowing God that is all-powerful. It's not the result of this knowledge. Salvation comes from a relationship. Even demons believe in God. Even demons know that God exists. Even demons can acknowledge that, but they are not in a relationship with him. We need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to acknowledge who he is. And we can learn the Bible from cover to cover, and that will give us all the knowledge that we want about God. But the next step then is to enter into a relationship with Christ, to give ourselves to him, to connect in a way and have a relationship with him that makes all of the other relationships in our lives pale in comparison then we become a true believer. It's estimated a couple of years ago that 65% of American adults considered themselves to be Christian, but only 33% of these adults think that confessing their sins, changing their way, giving their lives to Christ meant that they will go to heaven, that they will receive eternal life. That means that half of Christian adults in the U.S. felt like a relationship with Christ was not enough. What did they feel was enough? What they do checking that list of things that they do in order to get into heaven, working their way into heaven by by checking off boxes and making sure that they're working in such a way as to earn their way into salvation. And that's just false teaching. We need to have a deep personal relationship with Christ. And yes, that may lead to us working in in the kingdom and doing gospel work, that's for sure. But it's not how we gain our salvation. That's just religion. A relationship with Christ is what we need. Knowledge of God isn't enough. Believing he exists is no more uh, than the demons that we read about in Scripture. But having a relationship with Jesus is all we need. But let's get back to Paul's story in Acts 16. So that's really what we can pull out that that idea of the fact that demons recognize the fact that they were with God. But back to Paul's story in Acts 16, now verse 20, it says, they brought them before the magistrates and said these men were Jews, throwing the city into an uproar, advocating customs unlawful for Romans to accept or practice. And the owners of the slave were so mad that they lost their ability to make money off this slave. Now that they were turning on Paul and Silas, they took them to the magistrates, which were kind of elected officials by the Romans, and they called them Jews, which they were, so that was not an insult for them. Uh, And they were saying that the customs they were spreading were unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Well, I don't want to spoil the story, but later on in verse 37, we learn that Paul and Silas are also Romans. So this was a strange accusation. Obviously, they didn't know that. They just saw them as troublesome Jews, stirring up trouble, and certainly for for them, taking away their ability to make money. So what happens next in this saga? Well, verse 22 of chapter 16, it says, The crowd joined in to attack Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet with stocks. Now now there's a mob that's attacking Paul and Silas. Everything, everyone's got very riled up. Things are getting out of hand. The magistrates are not trying to calm this down or, or help the situation. They're now saying, strip them and beat them as well with rods. 
And it says that they endured being severely flogged. Not just the flogging, but severely flogged. And this would have left them an absolute mess, beaten. We can see here that this is one of the occasions that Paul talks about. Paul, in his writings in, in First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, talks about how he undergone all these different challenges in his mission in life. And he says, I've worked much harder, been in prison more, frequently been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent the night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. So he goes on and on about all the different things that have happened as he's been trying to spread the gospel as part of his missionary work. So part of it would be what we're talking about here. He specifically refers to this, uh, this particular um, happening in uh, chapter 2 of uh, 1 Thessalonians. It says, we have previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. So this is one of two occasions that Luke talks about where Gentiles, non-Jews, uh, persecuted Christian missionaries. So it was mostly the Jews that were persecuting them. But the Gentiles did on a couple of occasions. The other being in uh, Ephesus. So both these episodes come about because the power of the gospel has threatened the financial interests of the persecutors. So both times Gentiles beat these missionaries is because they had some financial impact from it. But when this was all over, they were thrown in jail. The jailer was given orders to guard them carefully. So what he did was he put them in an inner cell instead of on the outside with the outside walls, which it would have been easier to escape. So he carefully put them on an inner cell uh, and they put their feet in stocks. And if you're not sure what stocks are, they're just heavy pieces of wood that are locked together and they have holes in them where their ankles basically are locked in place. Uh, it says they're in chains, or it doesn't say they're in chains, but later on it says they're in chains. So we can assume that not only their feet in, in stocks, but also the hands are, or their wrists are in chains. Uh, so anyway, being in stocks means that even if you manage to get up from chains, you're not going anywhere because you can't walk anywhere. And frankly, with all the injuries that they went through and this beating as well, they would have been in a lot of pain. What's their response to this pain and this very uncomfortable circumstances they found themselves in? It says in verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. They're leading a worship service. They are being beaten, they've been imprisoned, they're very uncomfortable, their feet are in stocks, their hands are in chains, and they are leading a worship service in prison, singing hymns to the Lord, praying, and other people around them are beginning to listen uh, and probably thinking, these two are crazy. There's nothing good going on in this pit. But it's not the first time we see examples in Scripture where followers of Christ rejoice when they've been persecuted for their faith. In Acts 5, it talks about how the apostles have been flogged, and it says they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go, and the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for his name. Rejoicing because they've been counted worthy of suffering in the name of Christ. That's extraordinary, that kind of mindset the idea that it's a privilege to be persecuted for our faith. Why? Because we must be on the right track. If we are being such a threat to others and their beliefs that they want to persecute us for it, and in this case, beat and imprison them. It isn't, just, that isn't the only extraordinary thing about this story of Paul and Silas, because God now has a plan for this obstacle. They have been stuck, so they've been basically put in prison. That's halted their ability now to spread the gospel any further, to follow the Holy Spirit in any way. Uh, obviously, there's a small crowd of people in the prison, so they are evangelizing to them, but now they've been stalled. But God has a plan for this. Verse 26 says, Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house, 
set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So this story just took on a whole different turn. So they're stuck in prison, in jail, and they are disabled from doing their work, but God triggers the escape plan. The prison doors fly open, the chains came loose, and the jailer panics. He's ready to fall on his sword because he would be held personally responsible for the fact that they had escaped, especially since they told him, guard him carefully. But they assure him, we're still here, don't worry. I'm not quite sure how they got all the other prisoners to stay as well because instinctively you'd think they'd up and just run out of the building before Paul had a chance to address them. But anyway, or maybe they were shocked by the earthquake. But relieved, the, dra- the jailer rushes over to them and he can see it for exactly what it is, a miracle. He could see God's hand because only God could have orchestrated this and he wants to know how he can be saved. What must he do to have salvation in Christ? There's no doubt that at some point as they were singing and praying in prison that the guard would have heard as well, not just the other prisoners, but uh, the guard would have heard as well. And now this jailer is attending to their wounds. He and his household have become saved. They commit their lives to Jesus Christ. He's lost his fear now of the authorities. He doesn't really care anymore. He's like, I have the joy of Christ in me. It doesn't matter what they do to me. And for the first, And this isn't the first time that we see God springing people from imprisonment either. Again in Acts 5, a little bit before we talk about this fact that they were flogged and celebrated because they, now they were worthy of that. But Peter and the other apostles were in prison just before that. But it says, during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Simply opened the doors of the jail, brought them out, and actually he locked up the doors of the jail right behind him, so that kind of confused everybody in the authorities there. They couldn't quite understand how they got out and relocked the doors behind them. But, you know, that was another occasion that God sprung them from prison because he needed this gospel to go forward. He needed them out and doing what they needed to do. So this was his answer. It's a great story, but what does this all mean for us? How is this demonstration of imprisonment supposed to affect us? Well, the first thing is uh, that we need to realize that in our lives, we will be wronged. Of course, we've already been wronged. Everybody knows. If you haven't been wronged up to this point, then you just didn't notice it. (laughs) Everybody's been wronged in some way. And as Americans, we're very quick to jump on this. If we get any infringement on civil rights at all, we're very quick to jump on that and make sure everybody knows we've been wronged. And it happens constantly. And it, usually it's innocuous things. It's just things in our lives where we get wronged and we don't really think about it too much. It could have been that we got passed over for a promotion and we feel like that was wrong. Perhaps we were in a relationship, thought everything was going great, but then we get dumped and it's like, well, uh, we've been wronged. Perhaps someone hit our car in a parking lot, didn't even note. That's wrong. There's a thousand ways we can be wronged in our lives. It's just a matter of time before something happens. But we're very fortunate here that we don't get wronged because of our faith here. It's not really much persecution of Christians here. Yes, we might get criticized and we might get you know, different things said about us, but imprisoned, no. Killed, certainly not. Just like the demon of this, uh, that possessed this girl slave was yelling at them, calling them out, and not in a way that they wanted, that kind of thing happens here to Christians when we make things happen in God's kingdom when we begin to lead a life that is reflective of the disciple that God wants us to be for Christ, then when we begin to make a difference in the world, it's then that people begin to call us out because the evil one moves and has us called out to bring us down, to stop us from doing what we're doing, to stop us to influence other people with the gospel of Christ. And it's in this process that we could feel like we've been wronged. Perhaps it's untruths that are told about us to damage our reputation. That happens. That's probably the most easy way to wrong people that are beginning to do some effective ministries to bring them down with uh, tarnishing their reputation. Then they begin to lose a foothold in ministry. But what happens when we're wronged? As Christians, how should we move forward if we get wronged in these circumstances? Well, the first thing is we're wronged. We need to simply entrust our souls to our creator and just keep doing what is right. We can't abandon it. If, some, if we feel like somebody slighted us, we can't just abandon everything because we feel like we've been wronged and we just need to focus on that. We just need to keep focusing on God, our creator, and keep doing what is right. 
We also need to keep in mind that the witness that we can provide when we're wrong uh, comes from how we react. Non-believers are always watching us as Christians to see how we react to things, usually so they can be critical and point out our flaws as if we didn't have any or as if we claim we didn't have any. My gosh, we have flaws. That's why we need Jesus Christ in our life. We have flaws. But even when we're faced with being treated wrongly, we can minister to, in such a way that we become a great example of how to deal with it. Other people will see how we as Christians can deal with it. And when we're treated wrongly, we just need to trust the sovereign, all-powerful God to work it out for his glory. Not for our glory, but for his glory. We Frequently we see this in Acts. Examples of how God uh, shows us over and over again that he can work things for his glory. It comes back to this Romans 8.28 and we know that in all things, God's works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Well, Paul and Silas are chained up, hobbled by stocks and their ankles, and they sing to the Lord and they pray to God. Why? Because they know that if they just trust the sovereign, all-powerful God to work things for his glory, then they will merely become his hands and feet in the process. So we need to trust the process. Also, when we're treated wrongly, you know that uh, it's important for us to know when and why to stand up for our rights. The final verses in this passage today, verse, verse 35 onward, says, When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, Release these men. The jailer told Paul, The magistrates have ordered for you and Silas to be released. Now you can go. You can leave in peace. Just note there that, I mean... God was protecting the jailer right there. I mean, he, he didn't any consequences for what happened that night. They just simply told him to release them. But Paul said to the officers, verse 37, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now they, do, now they want to get rid of us quietly? No. Let them come themselves and escort us out. Feels like he's pushing his luck a little bit, but... The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the city, requesting them to leave the city. So they did escort them from the prison, but also asked them to leave at the same time. And he said, they did this to us, even though we're Roman citizens. And when the magistrates heard this, they were alarmed that they were Roman citizens because they knew what had happened, how they'd been treated, uh, because Roman citizens had rights. They had been violated in their treatment and they had every right to stand up and tell the authorities that as Roman citizens. Paul had self-respect. He knew that as a Roman citizen, he could lodge a complaint against these magistrates, probably get them removed from their position, maybe even affect the standing of that city, of that outpost of the Romans, because all the mob joined in as well. But he pressed his rights. He demanded respect. And as Christians, we should demand respect respect and we deserve respect also we have the right to evangelize in the name of jesus christ and if we begin to lose that right then we should stand up because we deserve that right the second thing we can put out is so that's if you're wrong so this shows us that we will get wronged at some point in our life how do we deal with that the second thing is that we can get from this passage is that god will provide for us even when it looks dire there are times in our lives where we feel like things have just gone in completely the wrong direction. It appears as if there's no way out. John Payton was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands of the South Pacific. And one night, some hostile natives surrounded the, the mission station where they were, and they were intent on burning down the mission statement, forcing Payton and his wife out of there so they could kill them. Payton and his wife prayed during this terror-filled night. They asked God to deliver them. And when daylight came, they were amazed to see all their attackers just left. A year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ. And remembering what had happened, Peyton asked the chief what kept him from burning down that house and killing them that night. The chief replied in surprise. He said, well, who were all those men that were there with you? Peyton knew of no men that were present. But the chief said he was afraid to attack because they had seen throughout the night hundreds of big men in shining garments and drawn swords circling the mission statement, the mission station. We may not be in situations where our lives are being threatened or a mob is demanding destruction or threatening to burn down our house, but we do find ourselves in tough situations. And they might be situations like personal relationships, they could be financial situations, 
They could be physical, they could be legal. We're very good at driving ourselves into circumstances and backing, a, uh, backing ourselves up against a wall. And as difficult as these times are, there are also times in our lives, these are the times in our lives when we see God move in amazing ways. He comes into greater focus when we see things happen in our lives that we could not possibly foreseen and we certainly couldn't have orchestrated even if we tried. And so when we do find ourselves in these difficult times, it's then that we can look for God and he will provide. It may not be exactly in the way that we expect, but certainly he is there and he will provide for us in some way. I'm sure Paul and Silas would much prefer to have avoided all the beatings and the imprisonment. And the answer came in an earthquake. That alone would have terrified all the people in the prison because they didn't understand at first that this was God's plan. Paul and Silas were singing and praying. They'd been through a bad beating. They were now in prison and an earthquake comes along. And they must have been thinking to themselves, seriously, we were beaten, we're in prison, and now an act of nature is potentially going to kill us because they didn't know it was God's plan at that point. I'm sure that they much would have preferred the experience that Peter and the apostles had in Acts 5 where they were just sort of taken out of the prison without any fuss. But no, an earthquake comes and that is God's plan. But God provides even when things look dire. It's also an illustration, this passage, of how God will remove chains. He will remove our chains. Picking up all of these heavy chains that we do throughout our whole life, we're very good at that. They're, they come in the form of idols, they come in the form of addictions, of money, woes, and sin. All these sins, the heavy chains of sin, we do this to ourselves. And it's a burden to us. They slow us down and at times they completely disable us from our walk as a disciple. They disable us from our ministry work. And all we have, uh, and we all have something that's holding us back, no matter how glossy we look on the outside. It's easy to look at people and say, well, they've got nothing going on, nothing wrong. Everybody has something holding them back in some way that they need to release. There's a story about Arthur Conan Doyle. He's the ingenious creator of uh, Sherlock Holmes. But apparently, he found great humor in practical jokes. And he played a practical joke on 12 of his good friends that happened to be famous people. And each of these men was considered to be very virtuous, highly respected men. For this joke, Doyle sent simply the same telegram to each of them that said, fly at once, all is discovered. Within 24 hours, the dozen men of noble reputation had all left the country, all of them. So no matter how good our reputation seems, we all have things that we are ashamed of. We all have things inside that hold us back. God knows them. And these are the things that chain us down. But just as God physically removed the chains that were imprisoning Paul and Silas, he'll do exactly the same for us with these burdens that we insist on carrying. We can be freed up and give it all to the Lord. Paul may be a shining example of apostle of Christ. He may be a man who was very focused on his mission, but even he was susceptible to these burdens and sins that came along. In Romans 7, he writes, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I know that good in itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. It's a very hard passage to read that. But he ends up saying, uh, the bottom line, verse 24, that what a wretched man am I? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? But then he goes on to say, thanks to God. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he knew that God will deliver him through Christ. And we can leave this baggage behind us. We can leave it at the foot of the cross. Our sins will be forgiven. We mustn't forget what they were, though. I mean, they'll be forgiven, but we can't forget what our sins were because we want the ability to able to learn from them and to not repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So yes, we can be forgiven, but we shouldn't forget. There's a story of Tom Watson, senior. He was the founder of IBM. So you can imagine the kind of money, the kind of investments that this man had, the sort of experiments that he would play with in business. He had a multi-billion dollar company. But years ago, when a million dollars was still worth a million dollars, Watson had a top junior executive 
who spent $12 million of the company's money on a venture that ended up failing. The executive felt terrible, so he put his resignation on Watson's desk and said, I'm sure you want my resignation after this. Watson said back to him, no, I don't want your resignation. I've just spent $12 million educating you. Now it's time to get back to work. God does not accept our resignation. Instead, he will accept our failures as part of the investment that he's made in our spiritual growth. But now he expects us to get to work, to learn from where we've been and not repeat it again and again. Sin doesn't have the power to hold us back, doesn't have the power to to make us a prisoner. God has broken those chains. It's what Jesus had in mind when he was up on the cross and his last words were, it is finished. The last thing we can pull out of this passage is that we can't waste any opportunity to glorify God. There are certainly times when we don't feel like glorifying God. There are times when we are tired of things going wrong. We are, there are times when we feel like God has abandoned us. He's no longer advocating for us in the way that he used to. But these are exactly the times that we need to glorify God. Because when we do, we're not only doing it for God, we're not only doing it for ourselves, but we're also doing it for the other people that are around us, other people that are influenced by us. People will see what we do. We may not want to be a mentor to people. We may not want to be an influence to people, but i got bad news. If you don't want to be any one of those things, you already are. You're a mentor whether you like it or not. Somebody in your life looks to you as an example. Because yes, we want to praise and worship God because we love him and we want to show him that we love him. And yes, we want to praise and worship God because it helps us too. It brings us back into a spiritual mindset. It helps us get back in step with the Holy Spirit and it can remind us of the joy of being in Christ. But also, it shows other people that even in the face of adversity, even when life isn't on that rosy path, when we have difficulties, it shows other people that we don't turn on the Lord that we don't blame him for the troubles in our lives. We praise him. We worship him, just like Paul and Silas. We sing and pray even when our backs are torn up from being flogged, even when our ankles are in stocks and our wrists are bound with chains. And what happens? Well, in this case, salvation. Salvation happened. The jailer, his entire household came to Christ. He was filled with joy, it says, because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. And we cannot waste these opportunities to glorify God, even if we don't feel like it. It will make a difference to us, but it will also make a difference to those around us. God never wasted opportunities, and he always says, Paul tells us numerous times to be reflective of what Christ is. God didn't waste opportunities. If you look at the story of Jonah, and we're going to get into the details of the story of Jonah after Easter, but in the story of Jonah, there's a great example of God not wasting an opportunity, something that you wouldn't think would even be an opportunity in the first place. But Jonah tells his, the sailors that he's with that the storm that they're enduring at that exact moment is because of uh, his resistance to God, because of his disobedience to the Lord. That's why the storm is going on. And he suggests to them that if they throw him over the boat, side of the boat, then their troubles will go away because they'll be distancing themselves from his disobedience. There was a little uh, resistance to that because the sailors didn't really want to throw somebody overboard. But they ended up throwing him overboard and the storm suddenly stops. And at that point, the sailors realize the power of God, and they begin to worship him. They saw the truth behind what Jonah had said. They feared the Lord. They saw the power of God to control the waves and to control the storms, and they worshiped him. This isn't even the main thrust of the story of Jonah. These guys were extras in this sort of epic story of Jonah. But God didn't waste the opportunity to demonstrate to them his power, his sovereignty, and these men ended up worshiping him. So we shouldn't miss the opportunities that come our way to show that we will glorify God even in the most difficult circumstances. The story of Paul and Silas is relatable to many people who live in places where there is a great risk to them personally to spread the gospel. In countries where Bibles are not allowed, in places where you cannot meet and talk about Jesus at all, In fact, these people have Bibles hidden in places outside of their homes so they don't get caught with them. And then when they go to these meetings, they pick them up out of wherever they've hidden them and take them to praise and worship the Lord. These are some major hurdles to overcome in their faith life. But they do it. Why? 
because our pathway as a disciple is to give ourselves to the glory of God. And often that means we'll find ourselves in very uncomfortable circumstances, in situations uh, that we just do not want to be in. But to me that speaks volumes because the reason the evil spirit spoke up at Paul and Silas, the reason the authorities time and time again persecuted Paul's, and ultimately the reason that Christ was crucified is all because the power of people is threatened by what, when they see the power of God in other people. When they see the power of God in believers, it threatens their own worldly power. And when we put ourselves in God's hands and we give up our own selves to Jesus, and we do what we've been asked to do in our verse for the year, which is 28:19 of Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then Jesus in the next verse tells us, surely I am with you always at the very end of the age. Because we don't need anything else. In every circumstance, however uncomfortable, all we need is Jesus. And it's because of that that we can be confident that when things look dire, he will provide for us. And in return, we can glorify his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just glorify you today. We just pray that uh, when we find ourselves in difficult circumstances, when we find ourselves in situations we certainly did not plan to be in or intend to be in, that we don't turn on you. Often these are just a result of our own sin. All the consequences of somebody else's sin. Help us to understand that, Lord, and to glorify you in all occasions. Because we want to be a light to others. We want to be an example to others. To show others how we, as your followers, can handle things in such a way because we know that you are with us. We know that you are all we need in every circumstance and that you will provide good from this. Open our eyes to see the good. It's not always what we expect. Lord, we love you. We pray that we glorify you in all that we do. And we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are this year unleashed because we are unleashed for living intentionally, for loving locally, and leading globally. This is our kind of overall theme for the year. We've looked at a variety of different things, and now we've kind of moved into this second missionary journey of Paul. Uh, and we're going to be in Acts 17 and a little bit of Acts 18, but primarily Acts 17. And this is where Paul and Silas now are on this journey, this missionary journey, along with Timothy. And, uh, and for, for a while, Luke was there, but now he's stayed, uh, stayed put. But Paul and Silas last week, we, they were in prison. They were imprisoned, and God sort of orchestrated this intervention through this idea of an earthquake that would free them. It flew, the doors flew open, the chains fell off, and that was how they managed to get out of prison. God couldn't leave Paul and Silas just languishing in a prison cell. There was too much that needed to be due. There was, there was, a, there was a mission journey that needed to take place. There were places to go and people to meet, literally. Chapter 16 ended with three words, and it says, and they left. They were in prison, they came out of prison, they were asked to leave Philippi, and they left. But we also have to remember, even though they moved on to the next place, we have to keep in mind that they weren't abandoning their mission at that time, they were just moving to the next place. Despite imprisonment, they had established a church in Philippi. The believers now would take on this task of growing the church there. Remember when they first went into Macedonia, so Paul was called in a vision to go to Macedonia. He went into Macedonia, and the first person that converted, and the first person that accepted Christ into their life was Lydia, and she was a, a dealer in purple cloth, the very expensive, the most expensive type of cloth that you could buy. So Lydia was the first person that they had managed uh, to talk to the gospel about, and she became a believer. And there's no doubt that there was a lot of influence that she would have had in society and in culture at that time, being a wealthy woman. Others in her circle of influence would probably have come to Christ as well. So this is what he leaves behind, is this group of believers who become the church in Philippi. Paul then circles back uh, in the third journey to Philippi. So this wasn't just left. It wasn't just a once and done, and then I'm moving on. Uh, and then later on in his imprisonment in Rome, he writes a letter to the Philippian church. 
So they moved on, but not abandoned the city of Philippi. And in chapter 17, we now can pick up their exploits. And it says, at the beginning of chapter 17, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. There was this, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and providing or proving to them the Messiah had, uh, had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. So they came to Thessalonica. I mentioned it briefly last week. This is still in the region of Macedonia. Philippi was in Macedonia. They're now in Thessalonica. It's about 100 miles from where they were. It is another key city in, the district of, uh, Mas- in a district in Macedonia. In fact, it is the key city because it was the largest city of Macedonia. Uh, it was also the capital of Macedonia. But it was also known uh, in the Roman world as a free city. They called it a free city. Very different from the Roman outpost that was Philippi. In this free city, it meant that they had the ability to teach these sort of non-state sanctioned gods. They had the ability to teach about gods. It didn't have to be, you know, Roman gods that were sanctioned before. But Paul, as usual, still managed to find a way to rile everybody up. So when he arrived in Thessalonica, it says that as was his custom... He went to the synagogue because this was kind of his MO. This is how he went to different places. He would go to the synagogue first. He would begin to teach the Jewish people there, relating the old scriptures that they knew to this coming Messiah, the Messiah that came. So um, that was what he normally did. Having said that, he did not do that in Philippi. Did not mention he went to a synagogue in Philippi, probably because there was not enough Jewish people in that city to justify a synagogue. But um, in Acts 16, it says... Uh, God, uh, Paul and Silas met God-fearing Gentile woman outside called Lydia, and uh, that was how they managed to spread the word there. They went to a river, they met uh, God-fearing Gentile women there, and that's how they presented the gospel in Philippi. But they're back on track now, and he's back in a synagogue uh, here in Thessalonica. And in Paul's day, synagogues were pretty open to the sort of receiving traveling Jews who they would have teach in the synagogue to give a slightly different perspective on the scriptures that perhaps, than perhaps they had before. Of course, Paul gave a very different um, sort of perspective on the scriptures. But he ended up teaching there for three Sabbath days. And only a, a handful of Paul's me- actual messages are reflected in the book of Acts. There isn't that many that are written out uh, in their entirety or at least in any uh, any form. But there's no doubt that he would tailor his messages according to the people that he was talking to, as, as anybody does. You tailor a message to the people that you are speaking to. But in general, it's reasonable to expect that the messages in the synagogue would have been very similar. They would have had this element of, these are the scriptures you know. These are the prophecies you know. Therefore, this is uh, the Messiah that has arrived. Paul's message that he gave in the synagogue in Thessalonica shows how this group, these Jewish scriptures contain these prophecies. And it's very likely that he would have repeated a large portion of what was recorded in Acts 13 when he gave a speech in Pisidian Antioch. And it was at that speech that he showed that, God's, uh, that David's assurance that God would not let the Holy One uh, see corruption. This is re- reference to Psalm 16. So in Acts 13, he talked about this. But he meant the Holy One, i.e. Jesus, the Messiah, would die and rise again. He very much implied that it was not David, but it was the Messiah that was referred to in that scripture. And also Peter spoke about the same thing in Acts 2. So this was an ongoing message throughout, uh, throughout the, the teachings that Peter and then Paul did later on. There's no doubt, though, that now Paul is settling into uh, this unsettled journey Seeing the second missionary journey now, he's, he's becoming uh, to a point where he's, he has customary ways of doing things. His faith in Christ is complete. He's developing his own way of evangelizing to these different places that he's going to, and he's growing the church in, in that process. His maturity as a Jesus follower was well developed now, and his maturity as a missionary was well developed, and it's becoming more and more developed everywhere he went. He was understanding how this process went. And of course, when we talk about spiritual or faith maturity, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a euphemism for being along in years. 
doesn't necessarily have anything to do with chronological age. We're talking about how mature people are in their faith. Paul was considered to be, have been in his 40s or 50s during his mission, mission journeys. But his maturity in his faith was way beyond most people. What I want to focus on in this chapter is this idea that, uh, of the importance of understanding that we must always, as disciples of Christ, be working our way towards maturity in our faith. Because when we do, then it enables us to be Christ's representatives in any circumstances, to take the gospel anywhere in any circumstances. Chapter 17 of Acts kind of follows this pattern. There's three different places that Paul visits and Silas. And we've seen in Thessalonica, he goes to the, this routine of taking the gospel, first of all, to the people. Uh, and the results of this are predictable, or at least they're becoming more and more predictable the more he does this. Because each place that he goes to, he comes up against some kind of resistance. And Thessalonica is, is no exception to that rule. Because in verse 5, it says, But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out, of the, out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Jason was welcomed, uh, welcomed them has welcomed them to his house. And they're all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. So the phraseology here is really good by Luke as he writes this. He says, he rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. So he went and found himself some thugs. Went to the marketplace. They're always hanging around at the marketplace, thugs. And so he went and he found them there and they formed a mob and then they went and started a riot. We've seen this idea of mobs being formed frequently in Acts already in Pisidian Antioch. We've seen it in Acts 13. In the beginning of Acts 14, we saw it Iconium and then later on in Acts 14 in Lystra. Not to mention the crowd turning really ugly on them last, uh, last chapter that we talked about in chapter 16. This was occurring very often, this pattern of uh, Paul going somewhere, preaching the gospel in the synagogue, everybody getting upset and then people turning against him. But this, this kind of thing is new. It's, it's easy to think that yes, in the last hundred years you hear about rioting in the streets and stuff like that. But there was rioting in the streets here in biblical times as well. But here we are. There are some things. We've got a mob together. They rioted in the streets of Thessalonica. Now they go looking for Paul and Silas. They get this posse. They go looking for Paul and Silas. But now they're not to be found this time. Last time they found them, they put them in prison. This time they couldn't find them. So what do they do instead? They grab the nearest sort of leader of the church that they could find, known, uh, known leader of the church, Jason. They drag him and a few other believers and they take him before the authorities. But here's the key is they couldn't accuse them of just promoting another God. And there were plentiful gods in that particular place that were being worshipped there because as I said, in Roman eyes, this was a free city. They had the ability to promote gods in any way that they liked. So if they just said, well, these people are promoting Jesus as a god, then they'd be like, okay, but that's okay. So they needed a slightly different angle when it came to the authorities. So this time they hit the Romans where they were most sensitive. It says they are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And this apparently sent everybody into turmoil. Not just the crowd, but it says the authorities also were in turmoil. You can claim that Jesus is a god, but if you call him a king, that's not good at all. Because Caesar was adamant that he and he alone was supreme. And so this idea of a rival king coming in the form of this new church would not stand. It was clever on their part. They found this loophole as to how they could get them arrested. But fortunately, the bail bond system was healthy back then, and they were posted bond, and Jason and his friends uh, went home. Another part that's worth mentioning in this particular passage is that uh, what they said about the new church and what, what they said about the people and the effect that they were having, I think they accidentally gave the church a compliment while they were trying to criticize them. They said, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And if you just think for a moment, if you were part of an organization that started off very small, but you were very passionate and 100% into this and just wanted to expand this into as many places as possible, but you're not quite sure how things are going, and then someone says that you've been affecting the whole world, 
even if it said they're making trouble, but they kind of knew that was the idea, they were going to make trouble. Uh, but when you hear that you are affecting the whole world, then you realize that what you're doing is effective, that you really are making a difference, that you really are changing people and affecting other people. Certainly, uh, they were affecting the Jewish world and now increasingly the Gentile world at the same time. But there is some satisfaction to be gained from hearing that, wow, you really are making a difference. But it comes back to this idea as believers that when we are at our most effective, it means that we are making trouble for the evil one. The resistance grows in certain areas. People try to stop us when we're being effective, disable the work that we're doing. Because it's the begi it begins to influence people, it begins to help other people, and most of all, it begins to transform other people as well. And that's not what the evil one wants. He doesn't tend to mess with people that aren't making waves very much. He doesn't tend to mess with people or worry about people that are living for self. He's not worried about people that are living an unrepentant life, living in worldly ways, because that is his realm of influence. But when believers begin to mess with that, when they get on mission... Then we're messing with his world. And as Peter says in 1 Peter 5, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And he'll bring the fight to us. He'll try to derail us. Like what's happening in Thessalonica and again in Berea, which is the, the, the next place that they go in chapter 17. And again in Athens, which is the third place they go in chapter 17. And then, the, and then again in chapter 18 in Corinth. The resistance came in slightly different forms in each case. Sometimes it was a mob or a riot. Sometimes it was just people grumbling or sneering at him or making fun of him. But resistance and general opposition to the gospel truth was there. So how do we resist that? How can we make sure that we have the maturity and that we have the fortitude to bring the gospel wherever the Holy Spirit happens to lead us, wherever he takes us on mission, whatever our calling is from the Lord? Maturity in our walk as a disciple is mentioned in Scripture in so many different places. And Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4, he wrote about this. And he said, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we, reach, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will be no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, we'll be speaking the truth in love. We will grow to become, uh, to become in every respect um, the mature body of him who is head, and that is Christ. So we're saying we build up our maturity in Christ. If we focus on our maturity as a disciple, then we won't be infants anymore. We won't be babies in our faith. We'll be growing and maturing to stop us being, as Paul describes it, tossed back and forth on the waves, blown here and there by every wind, teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their dreadful scheming. I love how descriptive Paul is in that, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their dreadful scheming. This is how the evil one works, through the cunning and craftiness to help us to, to go in the wrong direction, the wrong doctrine, the false teaching. And honestly, there was so much false teaching going on back there, as there is now. There is still so much false teaching. And the way we resist this is to find a way to develop our knowledge. And when our beliefs are such a strong foundation, whatever we come along, whatever we come across in our lives, whatever resistance we might come across in our lives, then it doesn't change anything. There's no way it can, because we have such solid, solid maturity in our faith. And when writing to the Corinthians for the first time, Paul also writes, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. And he frequently uses these analogies. Well, in the Old Testament in general, there's these analogies of infants and children uh, in our faith. But he's saying here, you can be infants in evil. That's okay. Don't grow in that area. But in your thinking, and consequently in your actions, be mature in your faith in Jesus. But it wasn't just Paul that talked about maturity. It wasn't just him that was obsessed with it. Peter also said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Peter also said, like newborn babies, again, it's that analogy, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow in your salvation. James says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says, because action is a sign of maturity. 
James also said, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And in Jesus, in John 15, it says, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So this all leads us to the same conclusion, that we are to focus in maturing in our faith and not be static. We've been through this idea before, this idea of growing instead of staying static. But It becomes much more important when we take the next step in our faith. It, ta- it becomes much more important when we take the next step and go on mission for the Lord. It doesn't just mean going on a mission, but it means being on mission, following the calling that we have in our lives. The idea that we're following God's calling means that we're following the lead of the Holy Spirit and being sensitive to his guidance. And at times that might involve a specific job. It might involve a specific mission. We might go on on the mission field, but it might simply be something that's just a purpose that God has for us. And when we get engaged in that, we we are to develop as believers through our own development, our calling and our mission and in his kingdom will become infinitely more efficient. And we will find that we'll have the ability to share the gospel wherever we are. That's how strong it becomes. Even in opposition to the mobs. Maybe not physically, maybe not literal mobs, but certainly metaphorically speaking, the mobs that will come to try and take us down and keep us quiet. Our own spiritual maturity at this point becomes a way to protect ourselves from these physical, a way to protect ourselves from the emotional and certainly the spiritual attacks. We covered last year extensively this concept of discipleship, and I think we've established that it's a process. It's not something that you become. It's something that uh, you accept Christ, and then you develop as a follower of his. You go through this long process. You don't get the certificate at the end. You're never done. It's just an ongoing and continual process. But I think the biggest thing that we can do to help us mature in our faith and in our walk is to limit the distractions in our lives, to set our eyes on Christ first and foremost, to see him primarily among all the noise in our lives. We, talk, we sang a song today, Jesus at the center. It's exactly what we're talking about, to set our eyes on Christ first and foremost. Because when we do that, the rest of what we need to do kind of fits into place underneath that. I don't know if you've ever played around with electronic circuits before, but when I was in school, we studied electronics in physics. I'd never particularly enjoyed physics. I vaguely remember the circuit side of it. Uh, I never put much effort into physics until somebody one day told me, well, you know, physics is how planes fly, right? And I I wanted to be a pilot, so suddenly I started taking a little bit more notice. Because before that, it was just one of those subjects where you're like, I don't know why I'm doing this. I can't ever imagine I'm going to use this stuff again. Uh, But anyway, so uh, we, we learned about how electronic circuits worked. And we'd be sitting together and, uh, in, in physics. We'd be stringing together a whole bunch of circuits. We'd get all the wires that we could. We'd get all these gadgets that are attached to these circ- in these circuits. And we would try and make as complicated a circuit as we possibly could because we were teenage boys. So we all wanted to compete with each other to see who could make the most complicated circuit and have it still work. It had little lights, uh, light bulbs in it. It had little buzzers. It had little motors, you know, the small motors and... That's how you know whether it's working, whether all these things are actually operating. So once our circuit was built, the wires are everywhere, the gadgets are everywhere, and then at that point we need to find a power source. So we go hunt down a battery that we're going to hook up to the vital wires uh, that are there, and we just hope that once we do, it all works. And the design of our circuit connects properly to all the devices. A Christ-centric life is like taking the battery first, and that's the fundamental belief in Christ, and connecting to it all the things as we go, all these different things, these gadgets, but all the different things in our lives that we want to connect to this power source. And then we see the power working in each of these areas, but we add to it, and we build on it, and we add to it, and it becomes more and more complex. But if we add too many things then when things don't work, we have trouble finding the disconnects. We have trouble figuring out why it is it's not working, why the power is not reaching where it needs to go. And that's how maturity in Christ works. His power in our lives affects every part of our lives that we connect to him. But if our ability to build these circuits becomes limited by us only, Jesus is an unlimited power source in our lives, but if we have too many things going on, too many things connected to him, then if, we've, if something fails then we have no way to figure out how to reconnect it or how to make it work. Some parts will work, 
Other parts won't. In our study on Wednesdays in the Daniel plan, the Daniel plan is a video study. It's a, uh, a study we've been doing. It's kind of this idea of getting to a more healthier lifestyle. It's led by Pastor Rick Warren, who was the former pastor of Saddleback Church. But he uses an analogy in the session on focus. He uses an analogy from a peach tree. He says when the spring comes and he has this peach tree, he gets very excited because he sees a lot of fruit growing on the branches of this fruit, of this fruit tree. And as time goes on, there comes a larger number of fruit forming. More and more fruit are growing and growing. The problem is now the, the branch is beginning to sag. And as soon as the peaches, uh, and soon the peaches stop growing because the tree can't feed all of the peaches at the same time and bring them to full maturity. And so what happens is in order to get the most mature and the most healthy peaches off this tree, some pruning has to occur. You have to prune some of these fruit off there. And it's a hard process because no one likes uh, to cut off a lot of what looks like perfectly healthy fruit. But, the looks, uh, but that looks like uh, the potential for a, a bountiful crop when you see that much fruit. But the reality is that it just won't reach maturity. None of it will reach maturity unless you prune it. And we become so spread thin in our lives with so many things that we are doing or want to do, and they're good things, and I can tell you from my own experience that there comes a point where all of these things, you look at them and say, I don't think I'm achieving anything good in any of them. None of these things are coming to maturity because it's just too many and it begins to weigh us down. If we prune some things, and sometimes it's good things that we need to prune, it allows us to focus on just the ones that are most important to us. And when we do, things begin to mature better. They begin to get better. They begin to get more effective. And as believers in Christ, our faith should be at the top. That should be our top priority of the list of things that we keep in our lives. And when we begin to focus on this and when we feed it, then God becomes more and more glorified in what we're doing. Being on mission without maturity or without taking the time to build maturity in our faith means that any trouble that comes our way will knock us off course. It means it'll knock us into, it'll push us into other areas. It'll send us down rabbit holes that we don't intend to go down, but it certainly will take us away from the path of discipleship. And soon, we've even lost the reason as to why we're doing it in the first place. Paul and Silas both had maturity in what they were doing. They had a single-minded focus on providing the people of Philippi, the people of Thessalonica, uh, and the people of Berea and Athens and Corinth, of supplying them all the gospel of Christ. And in every place that they went, they encountered some kind of resistance. But what did they do? They didn't just say, well, okay, we're done here. I'm weary of all this resistance. We're headed back to Jerusalem. It's too many idols. We can't possibly get a foothold here. What they did instead was they planted churches. They developed leaders in spite of all of the resistance. They went on to the next place, knowing full well that in every place they would go, they would find idols. They would find people that would, just didn't want them there. And this was accomplished through having a solid and unshakable foundation in their faith and the maturity in their faith. And on that foundation, they built that maturity so that the weather, they could weather the storms that came at every place that they went to. So when they get to this point, or when we get to this point, we can feel confident in our own beliefs, in our own relationship with Christ, that we can begin to share the gospel wherever God takes us, no matter what kind of resistance we get. And we find ourselves in a lot of different places. Sometimes it could be as simple as a grocery store. It could be an office, a boardroom, a school. It could be somewhere with a slightly more captive audience, like the DMV waiting room. <laughs> and I only bring that up because I always remember the story that Gene Sperling, who was the associate pastor before me here at New Hope, but he told me that he casually told me this story about a time he was sitting at the DMV, did not have an appointment, and he knew he was going to be sitting there for quite some time. So he sp started speaking to the gentleman next to him who also did not have an appointment and knew he'd be sitting there for some time. Imagine at the DMV, sitting there for a long time. But while he was waiting, he began to chat with him and after, the lo after a long wait and after a lot of discussion, he led this man to Christ in the DMV. And I must admit to myself, I thought, that's genius. <laughs> Maybe we as Christians should all go and sit at the DMV because these people are not going anywhere. They don't want to lose their place in line. <laughs> and when they've waited for a really long time, they are looking for some kind of hope, and it's the perfect time to give them the gospel. <laughs> 
But anyway, so yes, even at the DMV, wherever we find ourselves, then we should have a boldness to share the gospel of Christ. And it may look like the most unlikely place or even the most hostile place, but with maturity comes that strength and with maturity comes that boldness. Paul knew that when he went to Berea, it was going to be a slightly different audience. It was going to be a tougher audience. It says in Acts uh, 17, verse 11, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true, as I know you all do. You said that, I speak, you examine the Scriptures to make sure I'm not lying to you. But what Paul was saying to them was definitely under scrutiny and they were respected scholars of the word of God and as Paul delivered the message that he had for them, they were eager to hear it because they were scholars and they were always open to new ideas but they had to be sure of what he was saying because as it said, they examined the scriptures every day to see if what he was telling them was accurate. And again, this is where maturity in our faith comes in. We know what we're saying and we're confident in what we're saying. As a result, in verse 12, the result of that says many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. Many believed, prominent people also. And that's key because the prominent people back then are kind of what we these days would call influencers. They had the ability to bring others along in what they believed in. We don't really hear much about the Berean church again in Scripture, but uh, in Acts 20, we do know that Paul was heading back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater from Berea, and uh, along with a couple of other people from Thessalonica. It's important because Thessalonica was an example to all the people in Macedonia. The Thessalonian church was very well known to be incredibly good at evangelism. But we have to wonder if the Bereans, if these scholars, these noble people in Berea and their eagerness and enthusiasm for anything scriptural perhaps had some influence over the, the people of Thessalonica as well. But like the Bereans, we may not be known for our evangelism, but our love and our eagerness for scripture can be enough because it can definitely have an influence over people that may be more evangelistic. So we need to have a passion for his word. But despite all the initial enthusiasm of the people in the synagogue in Berea, coming up behind him, there were people from Thessalonica because there was all the problems in Thessalonica. They were in Berea. They were teaching. Now people have come from Thessalonica because they wanted to let people know. They got the crowds all riled up again. And so Paul moved on again 200 miles to Athens. Now Athens, a whole different ballgame. Athens was very different than the places that he'd been before. It was the capital of the ancient, the academic capital of the ancient world. It was the home of Socrates, of Plato, of Aristotle, and it was definitely a university city. It was very driven by academics. Paul noticed that there were a lot of idols. Obviously, there were idols in other places too. Certainly, Roman gods would have been around, Greek gods, but he mentions here, Luke mentions that Paul thought there were a lot of idols, particularly in Athens. And actually, Athens at times was called the junkyard of idols back then. We can learn from secular history that there were estimated at that time period to be about 30,000 idols in Athens. 30,000 gods in the city of Athens. There were gods everywhere. In fact, more gods than people there because the, at that time, the population of Athens was about 10,000 people and there were 30,000 gods uh, for 10,000 people. That's why one writer said, in Athens, it's easier to find a god than it is to find a man. There were gods on the hilltops. There were gods in the streets. There were gods in the homes. Gods everywhere. Here a god. There a god. Everywhere a god. <laughs> they worshipped everything. Therefore, they worshipped nothing. Acts 17, 16, it says, Paul was greatly distressed to see this. And so he says, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. So he did his normal visit to the synagogue. We talked about that. He goes somewhere, goes to the synagogue. He did that. He spoke to the people that understood the scriptures and understood how to connect the prophecies with the Messiah. But now in Athens, he also went to the marketplace because there was plenty of idol-worshipping people in the marketplace. And so he also, wanted to hear the, he also wanted them to hear the gospel message. So I want to close with this sort of example that Paul leaves us with two, two of the principles that we were talking about today. First of all, boldness by developing our maturity in faith and then the importance of sharing the gospel 
in places that seem like they would never ever receive it. The importance of sharing the gospel wherever it is that we go. And in Acts 17, 18 through 33, or 2 through 23, it kind of gives us this example uh, that Paul sets when he's in Athens. It says, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him, they brought him to a meeting of Areopagus, and they said to him, may we know what a new teaching it is that you're presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are religious. For as I walked around and carefully looked at your objects of worship, I even found an altar of this inscription to an unknown god. So it's like they ran out of names of gods with 30,000. They're like, well, let's just do one for the unknown god. So if you are ignorant, and the very th- so you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship, this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. And then he goes on to tell them about God. And he, he does it in a slightly different way. When you see the way he presents God here, it's a little different than the way he's presented it elsewhere. Um, but it's, uh, it's a different audience than he's used to. These are thinking men. These are philosophers, not familiar probably with the very early parts of Scripture. And Luke writes, as a quick description, that all these Athenians, uh, they spent their time doing nothing but talking and listening to the latest ideas. So you can imagine that a lot of people sitting around just talking about what's the latest idea that we hear and it's sort of pontificating about that for a period of time. But Paul, even knowing that all things that had happened in the places that he visited, stood up and he preached anyway in the marketplace. And the result was that some sneered, they made fun of him, but some of the people also became followers of Paul and consequently the followers of Christ. Because if we focus on our faith, center Christ in our lives, prune the things that distract us from our walk as a disciple and develop our faith in our lives, then we will mature. And as we do, we, first of all, are less able to be pulled away from being on mission for Christ. It allows us to see much more clearly our calling in his kingdom, to stand strong when things get tough, and they do get tough. And we will, when we meet resistance, or if, even if we meet just some sneering or somebody making fun of us, or maybe it's a complete collapse of everything around us, maturity creates a solid footing for us to be on. It creates stability. And it nurtures us in our boldness to be able to speak out about the driving force in our lives, and that is our power source, Jesus Christ. Wherever we happen to find ourselves, Whatever kind of hostility we find ourselves in, we are called and commissioned to declare to the world that God is Lord and that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. And it's in him that we can find our source of power. It's him, in him that we can find our source of love. And it's in him that we find grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just thankful for... For Luke's writing about Paul's missions, and Lord, we're just grateful that uh, we can see in Paul the examples that we need to see to be bold, but most of all to develop maturity as we go uh, through our lives. And just as Paul went from place to place, we will come across hostility, we'll come across those doubters, but Paul gives us an example of how to deal with that, to just keep on pushing to stay mature in our faith, to use it as a foundation and a springboard to go from. And Lord, so we just pray that we have the wisdom and discernment every time we come across naysayers that we can just keep pushing forward. We may have to move on, but we leave behind us the seed. We leave behind us some knowledge and we leave behind us something that will grow in other people. Well, church, good morning. Oh, that was so nice. First service was still waking up a little bit, so... You guys are already doing better. Those of you watching online, thank you so much for joining us. I have a very important question for us this morning. How many of you have ever run a marathon? Anybody? Yeah? Like a full marathon, like the big boy, big, big mama jamma. Yeah, well, congratulations. You are far better than me. Um, as I'm sure you can tell, I am not one of those people. Um, running is not something that I look forward to doing. It is not a hobby of mine. 
uh, nor do I really ever do it. And I'm pretty sure there is a proverb somewhere that says, if you are running with no one chasing you, then it is a sin. (laughs) I'm pretty confident I've seen that in the Bible uh, somewhere. You can quote me on that. (laughs) But maybe, okay, so maybe not like a full marathon, but how many of you have ever run like a 5K or like a 10K? Something a little bit shorter, yeah? Wow, again... You guys are way better than me. Um, That is not my prerogative to do, but my mom, on the other hand, is somebody who has done many, like, 5Ks uh, and smaller, like, races like that. She enjoys it. I don't get it. I didn't get blessed with that gene. Um, That is hers. And so... Good, good on her. But there's one big one that she likes to do uh, most years. We haven't done it in a little bit. But there's this race called the Wharf to Wharf Race over in Santa Cruz. And it's a big race that goes between the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Capitola. And it's really cool. It's fun. You can run it. You can walk it, whatever. And it's just the most beautiful, gorgeous scenery of, like, the northern coast. It's absolutely stunning. But... For those that are unfamiliar, who have not participated in a race of that kind, um, what you will see is not only will you see people who go and like dress up as like chickens or bananas or I don't know, something weird. Um, There's a lot of weird people that do this for the fact that they're running in general, but that's again a different story. But you have people who will go dressed up to have fun, but you will also see people lining up on the entire path of the race, cheering people on. Uh, They might be playing music or even handing out water or snacks or this stuff called goo. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Uh, It's this like gel thing that is like pure calories. It's weird. I don't know. I've never had it. But I think it's beautiful and fun because you have people who are physically torturing themselves in this process, and then you have a group of very sick people watching it happen. <laughs> it's weird. I don't get it. I, there's things I enjoy running and watching running is weird. And it's, it's this weird kind of thing that you see. But the nice thing that they're doing is that they're yelling, right? They're encouraging the people on the sides are cheering them on, trying to give them some kind of encouragement or even a nourishment for them with water, snacks, or goo. The music that they might be playing might either be like a live band cheering them on. Maybe it's like speakers and somebody's like just kind of DJing or playing it off of like a phone or something. Maybe they're playing the song Staying Alive. So that way to encourage them with a good pace or maybe if they pass out and need to do CPR, you kind of got the the BPM ready to go um, to that song. But you have all these different people providing them with different things, and all of this is a fun way to support people as they are kind of moving along, trying to accomplish the goal that they set out to do. Now, the goals that people have when doing a race can range from, you know, trying to be the fastest one, get there done first, and like win the race, where you might have some dressed up bananas that are just there to finish at some point. You know, like there's a difference of goals, but the end of that is all the same, and that's to finish. What we are going to be reading and what we are going to be talking about today is is very similar. Not running, but what we are going to be doing is reading about people who are being an encouragement and supporting others and doing the encouraging as they themselves are also running the race for the end goal that is Christ. And so if you would, please open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. Uh, We are going to be continuing or open up on your phone, iPad, whatever you have. We're going to now pick up where we left off last week, where Paul was in the midst of visiting some churches. He was talking to them. Some crazy stuff was happening. He had to leave and move on to other places. But what we're going to be doing is this is kind of coming towards the end of Paul's second missionary journey, and he had spent some time in the city of Corinth with the people there, but it was now time for him to leave. And so with that, we're going to start at verse 18 of chapter 18 of the book of Acts, and it says this, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila, and before he sailed, he had cut his hair off at Centuri, Centuri, that's how you pronounce it, because of a vow that he had taken. So Paul, being on his way out, 
He is leaving the city of Corinth, but what does he do? It says here that he cut his hair because he was coming to the end of a vow that he had made. But what kind of vow would this be? Some people, and by some, I mean most people that I even see online, um, a lot of smart, much smarter people than me, believe that this is a Nazarite vow. In the book of Numbers, chapter 6, you get the description, the full description of what the Nazarite vow included. And what this was is um, it was the purpose that someone, or the purpose of this would be for someone taking the vow to be dedicating their life for the Lord for a period of time. And what would happen is they would um, refrain from drinking any wine or any other kind of fermented strong drink. Um, they wouldn't even consume anything that was from the vine itself. So no grapes, no grape juice, nothing unfermented from the vine, no grape leaves, anything like that they would refrain from. They also weren't allowed to cut their hair. Even more specifically, how they described it was that no razor could touch their head. And so this is including their neck and their face as well. And so you would always be able to tell somebody that was taking the Nazarite vow because they would have hair just coming out of everywhere. It would be kind of weird. But you would know. Like they're fulfilling, they're doing a purpose. They're dedicating their lives for the Lord. Part of this vow was to be instructed to not go near any dead bodies as well. Part of the Old Testament law was, you know, uh, death was seen as something that was unclean. So if you touched a dead body, you were immediately unclean. The same goes for the Nazarite vow. If someone then were to suddenly die in front of a person taking this vow, then they would have to shave their head. And on the seventh day uh, after this, the, on the seventh day after they would shave their head, and then on the eighth day they would bring two doves or two young pigeons as an offering, one as a sin offering and one as a burnt offering. They would then consecrate themselves again and then rededicate themselves for the Lord. And this would be for the same period of time as the vow that they had originally taken. Now when this person would eventually fulfill their vow, they would then present their offering to the Lord. And again, mind you, this being in the book of Numbers, there's a lot of rules and specifications about it. And so they would have to bring a year-old lamb as a burnt offering they would bring a year-old ewe lamb for a sin offering. They would bring a ram for a fellowship offering. They would bring a grain offering, a drink offering, and a couple different kinds of bread offerings. Lots of offerings, lots of things to, to bring if you were doing this vow. And after all of this, the Nazarite would then shave their head, uh, and they would take the hair that they would collect, and then they would put it in the fire that was underneath the fellowship offering, to which excuse me, the uh, rabbi or the, the, would take uh, a piece of the boiled ram shoulder and wave it around as a wave offering, whatever that is. And then at this point, once that was all fulfilled, the Nazarite would then be able to consume wine again, consume fermented drinks, because their, their vow had been fulfilled. It had been completed. Uh, I personally, myself, um, don't think that this is what Paul was doing specifically uh, here in verse 18. Because if you think about it, the book of Numbers obviously is in the Old Testament. And so being so, the, this vow was technically under the Old Testament law. And now we as believers in the New Testament, we, are, we know that the Old Testament law was put there in place to make us realize that we are not perfect, we can never be perfect, and that we need something else in order for us to approach God in his righteousness. And Paul, being a Pharisee, would know that. He would know that this vow specifically is part of the Torah because he was a dude that would study the Torah. Most young Jewish men would study it and they would know it kind of. And then he was a guy who was like, I know the Torah. Like I can recite it forwards, backwards, whatever you got, I got it. So he would have known all of this. And because of that, um, when we read this verse, it makes no mention of him uh, providing any of the sacrifices that were listed in the requirement for the, uh, for the Nazarite vow. Not only that, Paul himself actively preached in his other writings that those who followed Jesus were no longer bound to the law. And so with that in mind, my guess is that this wasn't the specific Nazarite vow itself, but a 
some kind of variation of that. And the way we can think about it is like fasting that we do today. Um, we are currently in the season of Lent uh, if, uh, that other Christian traditions follow uh, and observe uh, more closely than we do here at New Hope. Um, but part of that is people are then required to fast from something. What we would read about in Scripture, typical fasts would be from food or alcohol or some kind of drink, um, which part of you know fasting in the Lent season could be that. Um, or, you know, we can see in, in today's culture people fasting from different things like um, maybe sugar or carbs, which that doesn't sound like fun. Um, so I don't know why people would do that, but people run, so I don't know. <laughs> so you can fast from uh, sugar, carbs, maybe even video games or social media itself. Or maybe even uh, people fasting from having to watch the 49ers lose again. Um, you know, I, I had to bring it up. I'm so, you know, I'm not sorry about it. But whatever your fast may be, from football to sugar, uh, this is something that you give unto the Lord for a period of time. And I believe that this is what Paul was doing, where, you know, some of those things might be a variation. I think this is a variation of that Nazarite vow uh, that he would then take for the sole purpose of dedicating his time in Corinth for the Lord. Now, we don't know specifically when that started, but we know when it finished. And I think the thing to keep in mind and the important thing about this is that he had completed what he had set out to do. So with that, let's continue now into verse 19 to 22. Verse 19 says, They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if the Lord, uh, if God wills it, or if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed in Caesarea, he went to Jerusalem and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. So Paul uh, he had just spent a good chunk of time of his life moving around, right? Going from city to city to city to city. And he went from one place to the next. And he was with some friends of his. Um, and then at one point, he wasn't. Kind of dropped him off and said, all right, I'll see you guys later, maybe. Um, he dropped them off in Ephesus, preached in the synagogue. They were like, hey, hang out with us. He's like, nah, I got to go home. Uh, so he left said hi to the people in Jerusalem, and then made an intentional effort to get back to his home church in Antioch. After spending time with these churches, he, he had to go see them because these were people that had an investment in who Paul was, and these were people that supported him throughout his mission and through his journeys. These were people that cared for him, so he wanted to follow through with, with them and tell them what was going on. But again, it was time for him to go home and get some rest. So let's continue reading now at verse 23. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthen, strengthening the people. Now we might not know exactly how much time Paul spent um, resting and spending time in Antioch, but we do know that once he was done, he went back to work. Right? He spent time, again, going from one place to the next, but this time his job was to strengthen and to encourage these other disciples. And this was something that Paul was incredibly good at. This was a strong suit of his, was to go and strengthen and encourage and equip these people and the work and telling them what God was doing, right? Like he just spent time out. He wanted to encourage them. This is what God was doing. And maybe even... Um, correcting them uh, where they needed it. And this was his duty. And this was an example that I think we too can also live by. But we'll get to that in uh, just a moment. So continue on uh, now at verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed by the way of the Lord, and he spoke with a great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew about the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. All right, what do we have here? 
we have this incredibly smart man named Apollos coming to Ephesus, coming into a new city that he's not from, but he knows the Lord. He knows Jesus. He knows his work, and he is zealous enough to go and preach that to the Jews and preach that to people that need to hear it. But unfortunately, his knowledge was incomplete, right? He says that he only knew through the baptism of John. So here's what a commentator named Matthew Henry uh, says about Apollos and this incomplete knowledge. He says that he knew the preparing of the way of the Lord by the voice crying in the wilderness rather than the way of the Lord itself. We cannot but think he had heard of Christ's death and resurrection but was not let into the mystery of them. He had not had the opportunity of conversing with any of the apostles since the pouring out of the Spirit. Or he had himself only been baptized with the baptism of John, but was not baptized with the Holy Ghost as the disciples were at the day of Pentecost. So we know this dude's smart. We know that this dude's zealous. But we know that his knowledge was incomplete. And so he hadn't had the chance to experience the Holy Spirit in the same way And so in his preaching, although it was incorrect, it was still excitable. But that doesn't change his gifting. Even though it was incomplete, it doesn't change the fact that he was using the gifts that God still ultimately gave him. He was just incomplete. And so with that, Priscilla and Aquila, having spent time with Paul, they were in Ephesus, they heard this man, And they knew what Paul had said and what God was doing through Paul. And they themselves knew God's desire for his people. And so when they heard this incorrect thought, they responded. And I think there's a couple of things that we can take note of in their response. And the first is that Priscilla and Aquila listened to him and then they corrected. They listened to him and then they corrected him. And secondly... He himself humbly listened to their instruction and then improved what he was saying. It doesn't say that they interrupted him. It doesn't say that they called him out in a very public way and they didn't put him on blast or anything. Like they, They showed him hospitality and they explained it to him. They invited him into their home. Now, with Apollos, we also don't even really see his reaction. We don't fully know if it was humble or if he just kindly listened and nodded his head and said, okay, yeah. But what we do see is the reaction to this correction. And what we do see is the outcome of that interaction that takes place. And that happens in verses 27 and 28. It says, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Now what we can see is that once this instruction happened, once he was corrected, he wanted to then go somewhere else to share this new knowledge that he had been given, specifically to the land of Achaia, which if we look at this map... Uh, that we've looked at before. Achaia is, well, let's see if this laser is going to work. Nope. Oh, kind of. So Achaia is in this top left corner. If you're watching online, it's on the top left corner of the screen where you'll see it is actually southern Greece. So you'll see the city of Athens. You'll see Corinth. You'll see the city with the funny name that I can't pronounce. You'll see Thessalonica, Berea, these other places. This is the region he wanted to then go back to and share this new knowledge that he had and did so to prove that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. So, what does this mean for us here today? What what can we take away from this message? What can we take away from this interaction And I know that I already mentioned a couple of things that we can learn from Priscilla and Aquila, which those are still true. But ultimately, there are three things that I think we should be paying attention to when reading this story. And the first is the importance of checking in on the people that we care for or the people that we are discipling. The second is how to then humbly criticize incorrect thought. The third is how to then humbly receive criticism. The importance of checking in on the people we care for, our discipling, how to humbly criticize incorrect thought, and how to humbly receive that criticism. 
So the importance of checking in with the people that we care about. So far, within the last year and a half that I've been at this church, we have really hit the nail on the head of the importance of discipleship, right? Training up people to know the word of God, to know the way of the Lord, and now to kind of beat the dead horse of what this next year is. Our job then is to then send people out, to go and make disciples amongst all the nations. That is our goal. That is our mission as believers. But what do we do after that? Once we train people up and once we send them out into the world, what do we do? Because now what they are hap- what's happening with them is they are able to experience the work of God. They ex- they're able to experience doing the work of the Lord. They get the chance to take their training wheels off and experience life in, in service to who God is. And when they do this, they need to know that they are supported by you and by the local church. Because you see, doing ministry is not just designated to the full-time or part-time staff that work at a church. Yes, we are doing ministry. We're doing, this is what we get the chance and what we are called to do. But the ministry itself is not just this. Simply put, doing ministry is serving people or serving God's creation and telling them about Jesus and loving people like Jesus would love them. This includes, yes, missionaries, people sharing the gospel regularly, people leading Bible studies or small groups, people that volunteer on a regular basis, and and, and maybe this doesn't even involve, or specifically, it's not just for the people involved in the local church and volunteering within the local church, because the hope is that maybe you would be trained up here, that you'd be discipled here at New Hope, and that We would then send you out into whatever environment you find yourself in, whether that's in the workplace, whether that's the coffee shop you find yourself in, the salon you find yourself in, whether that's interacting with people at the grocery store, whatever that may be, you are now out in the world able to do a ministry for the work of God. Sharing the gospel with people, doing ministry. But that's incredibly exhausting. And it's incredibly difficult. Ministry itself is very difficult because people are difficult, right? We're all broken. We're all imperfect human beings. And oftentimes we need a lot of help. And when we need a lot of help, we can sometimes respond poorly. And that's incredibly draining to continuously give and give and give and pour yourself out on a regular basis, which is why it is so important for us that are then doing the discipling to then go and encourage and strengthen and fill back up the people that we have around us. Yes, ultimately they are to be filled up by God and the Holy Spirit, but it is also our job to be used by God using our gifts that he has given us to then encourage, strengthen, and fill others up as well. I don't know if you knew this, but we as human beings are not like the Energizer Bunny, right? What did, he, what did Paul do on his way back from his trip? He went to his home church and he rested. What did he do after he was filled up? He went back out and filled up the cups of other people that he had ministered to already. Remember, these churches are, are brand new, right? All of these ancient churches are brand new. They don't have the same luxuries that we do. We in today's day and age, have the luxury of being in a city or between two cities where there are over 400 churches. 400. Which is, there's probably even more that's not on the official count or whatever. But, like, we went to the, the Fresno Clovis prayer breakfast on Tuesday, and we were sitting in this whole convention hall with over 2,600 people, all Christians, there to, to pray for the city and to listen to Tony Dungy speak, which is, again, it's, it's a nice guy. He's speaking on prayer. It's awesome. But it's safe to assume then that between the two cities that we live in, that it is easy for us to find other people who have common values, a similar worldview, even similar religious opinions or views on things. Specifically even here in the city of Clovis, it's really safe. It's a safe place to assume that who we interact with will most likely share in common values that we have. And that's okay. It's a great place for us To be in. Maybe not the same views too. We'll be a little bit different here and there. But most of the time it will be fairly common. But these churches that Paul planted and revisited. 
They didn't have that. They had nothing. They were the only source of the gospel and of the light of Christ within a city filled with Gentiles, people who believed in other gods and ultimately even served under an emperor who himself thought was a god. So it's a difficult situation. And so it makes sense why these churches with them need encouragement on a regular basis. And this, what this makes me think of is the importance of the recovery process that happens uh, when doing sports. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with like sports recovery or anything like that. I, again, am obviously not the most sporty dude. Um, but I do know kind of a little bit about this. And I was looking up uh, an article that I found from UC Health that I think explains this a little bit better than I can. It says that rest and recovery is an equal, equally essential component of an exercise program because it gives the body time to repair, rebuild, and strengthen itself between workouts. Exercise, especially intense exercise, creates tiny tears in the muscle. Over time, as the muscle heals, they eventually grow bigger and stronger. It's important to remember that this process occurs during rest and recovery, not during the exercise itself. Within this article, they interviewed this uh, doctor named Dr. Karen Van Back, who is the assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and the Department of Orthopedics at the University of Colorado. And she's quoted to say, in order to see gains in fitness, in order for the body to keep doing what you want it to do, you have to give it enough rest to repair itself. And if you're an athlete, that means taking time from your usual sport. And the article continues saying, active recovery actually increases blood circulation, which helps remove waste products from the soft tissue that have been broken down by the intense exercise. Fresh blood then flows, delivering nutrients that help repair and rebuild muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So Paul's job was to be a part of this, these people's recovery process. His job was to then be a part of their rest. And the only way that this church and these churches that he visited could recover was, was being helped and encouraged and loved on by Paul. And in the same way that our own human body needs to recover after physical activity, when we are serving the Lord and giving of ourselves, we also need to take time to recover. And as we are seeing the people that we are discipling serve the Lord and drain themselves, we then get the opportunity to fill them up and to encourage them. Part of that might also be correction when it needs to happen. And so the next point then to pay attention to is how to humbly criticize incorrect thought. Like we saw with Priscilla and Aquila do with Apollos, we need to follow in their example. Now, I myself am no personal expert in psychology or sociology, so I don't have all of the right technical terms, but I do believe that there is scripture that we can then read to, we can reference, and we can learn from that can then ultimately help us do that. So uh, I'm going to rattle off a lot of different verses. Uh, I don't have slides for them today, unfortunately. Uh, but if you would like to, I'd encourage you to write down the verse references so you can revisit them later. Um, or unless you're really motivated to practice your sword drills and try to find those verses while I'm saying them out loud, praise be to God, you do you. Um, but maybe write them down and revisit them later. Uh, first verse, Galatians 6, one it says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Restore them gently while making sure that you take care of yourself so you're not tempted, right? Easy enough. Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer versus harsh words. Colossians 3.12-14. Therefore, as God's chosen people... Holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, 
gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Be compassionate. Be kind. Be humble. Be gentle. Be patient. Forgive people that have wronged you. Don't forget to love them. And this kind of love that it's talking about is what's called agape love or this benevolent, good-willed, unconditional kind of affection. 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 through 26. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful, Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Don't try to look for an argument. Be kind. Gently instruct these people. What it also says here, and I think really highlight it, underline it, is that it says, in the hope that God will grant them repentance. That's the key. It's not us who will ultimately change someone else. It is God working within them that will give them that courage and convict their heart. Our job is to humbly submit ourselves to the Lord, gently encourage them towards the truth of Scripture, and let God do the rest. Something that I think we can also pull from their example is that this was a very personal interaction between Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos. Although we don't know exactly what that conversation looked like, we can see that it wasn't personal. It was a very personal one. Like I mentioned, like they, they had invited him, him into their home in order to explain what he was saying was wrong. It wasn't a public shaming or an anonymous con- comment. They showed him hospitality. And something that I find really interesting is that it is commonly known within church culture, especially if you've worked in the church or been around the church for a long time, that people will often leave anonymous comments about whatever they don't like. And that could be on a comment card, connect card. It could be on a tithing envelope. And those notes are obviously anonymous. So no names attached to it, left in the tithe box for us to read. And, and from a leadership perspective, like we do hear that, we read it, and we we take notice of it. It's important to us. But I can also tell you that it would mean far more to us if you would talk to us in person. If there was something that you truly didn't like or something you didn't agree with or a suggestion that you would have, it would mean so much more to us as a church if you met with us in person, called us on the phone, and talked to us and made it a personal invitation. That goes so much farther an anonymous letter or anything that we can, can find or hear third hand. The same even goes for when people are leaving the church. We would way rather hear why you are wanting to leave the church in a kind and humble way so that we can then grow and learn from our mistakes and be able to better serve the people that are still here. But that also leads me to the last point to pay attention to, and that is how to humbly receive criticism. Because even if criticism is given in the most kind, humble, gentle, loving way possible, it doesn't mean that that criticism still doesn't hurt. And that's okay. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, or one person sharpens another. Have any of you ever seen a close-up image of a knife being sharpened? either through like one of those little pull-through things or like on a sharpening stone. What's happening is little pieces of metal are literally being shaven off of the knife itself, literally taken away from it. Or in John 15, 1 and 2, it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that, does, that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will, it will be more fruitful. The act of pruning itself is cutting away parts of the plant, right? In the, in the goal of it 
growing back more full and more fruitful and even better than it once was. In both of these examples, you have that removal of parts of what it is in order for it to be better. And in a human sense, that hurts. Because there's friction involved, especially with like the knife sharpening thing and iron hitting iron and everything. Like there is friction, there is heat. And part of that friction is that people don't want to be wrong, right? People don't want to be told that what they're doing is actually incorrect. We act on things and do things and believe things because we think it's right. And when we think something is not right and we do it anyways, that's ignorant and sinful. And so when someone comes and tells us, that what we are doing is wrong, our pride then has the tendency to want to rise and get in the way because we want to believe that our actions are correct. And so when our actions are called into question, how then are we to respond? Here are some more verses to keep in mind. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. It may hurt, but hopefully the correction that we are receiving from trusted people is actually to help us. When incorrect behavior or sinful behavior is then applauded, it actually is far more destructive, but it feels better because we're affirmed in what we're saying and what we're doing. Proverbs 15, 31 and 32. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but the one who heeds correction gains understanding. It is far greater for us to grow in wisdom by learning from the correction of other people so we can better understand how to live our lives for the glory of the Lord. James 1, 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce righteousness that God desires. Our first job in receiving criticism is to listen. Try to understand what's happening and suppress the anger so that we can actually work towards the righteousness that God desires for us. And lastly, Romans 12, 17 through 19. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. When we feel like we've been attacked or hurt by someone, it is not our job to fend for ourselves. It is also not our job to then lash out and, and do evil in return for the evil that we feel like was done to us. We cannot play the same game. We cannot play the evil game back to that person. It's like the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. If we truly believe that, we truly believe that the Lord reigns supreme in our lives and is in control of all things, then we can then be confident that he will then be the one that protects us against these harsh words. Even when that criticism that we receive is not in the way that we would like or not gentle or not out of humility or maybe even the criticism is something that's not wrong and, and you're correct, we are still called to respond out of peace because ultimately God will take care of us because God is our defender. We are to patiently wait and listen to everything that is being told to us. And again, if it's truly out of love and not out of hate, then that correction is far more helpful. When we do that, when we actively listen and we try to understand that brings far more honor to God because even when that correction is misplaced or incorrect, then it ultimately is not up to us to fight for the opinion of others. The only person that truly matters is God. And so yes, 
Receive criticism with a humble and soft heart for the Lord and let God be the one that actually convicts you. Church, this message is just as much for me as I believe it is for all of us here today. I myself am a notorious people pleaser and so criticism has the potential to deeply hurt me because I just want everyone to be happy. I want people to think fondly of who I am and have a good opinion of who I am. And if I don't submit that to the Lord on a daily basis, my motivations can actually be incorrect. And so I say all of this today not as a rebuke from one who has figured it all out, but as an encouragement from someone who's trying to figure out how to prioritize the opinion of the creator of the universe rather than the creation itself. So let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you are our defender. We thank you that you love us, that you care for us. We thank you that there's a right way for us to interact with the people that are around us. And so I ask, Lord, that you would help us to be humble. That as we go and try to tell people of who you are and correct the incorrect thoughts that we see and hear, that we would do so humbly and gently. And then as people respond back to us, or as we ourselves are being corrected, that we would do so in the same. That our hearts would be soft for you and that we would be used by you to then go and and, and fill the cup of the people that are around us, that love us. So Holy Spirit, we need you, and we love you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. All right. (laughs) Oh, you stuck. It was amazing. Very reflective of how great God is. All right, we're in Acts 19 today. Acts 19, and we are unleashed this year. We are unleashed, and the subject for the year is how we are on mission for God, serving Him in the right way, the way that we are called to serve. And this is part of this is figuring out how we are called to serve. What is it that we should be doing in the kingdom of God when we are on mission? And once we're on track, once we're on mission, then we can tap into the Holy Spirit to guide us according to His will. And we can find that our efforts get multiplied through the Lord's blessing. The things that we thought would have been completely uh, unable to do, beyond our reach, suddenly become more of a reality, much more achievable. Not through our own merit, not through our own strength, but through the Lord working through us. One of the ways that we've been examining this example of how to be on mission is to look at the second missionary journey of Paul. But the reality is that we're not actually in the second missionary journey of Paul anymore. We've now evolved into the third missionary. And I have a map just to give you an idea of what the third mission journey of Paul looks like. Because now we've kind of moved from, in chapter 18, we kind of moved on from the second journey into the third journey, but they are all connected together. And today we'll be looking at chapter 19, or at least we'll be focusing mostly on the second half of chapter 19. And it says, at the beginning of that chapter, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived in Ephesus. And you can see it on the map, Ephesus is up uh, halfway up um, in uh, Turkey. So this was, it wasn't Paul's first trip to Ephesus. This wasn't his first time visiting Ephesus. Uh, last week, Pastor Kyle in chapter 18 covered the uh, Uh, He covered that, and Paul, it says in there, was in Ephesus briefly. In verses 19 through 21 in chapter 18, it says, They arrived at Ephesus where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He uh, He himself went to the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and when they asked him to spend a little bit more time, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set set sail from Ephesus. So it was God's will. And here he is back in Ephesus on the third mission journey. So let's take a minute just to learn a little bit about what Ephesus is. What is Ephesus all about? Put some context into where we're going to be talking about today. Uh, The letter that Paul wrote much later on, Ephesians, was to the church in Ephesus. And Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. 
It's now a town called Selchuk. Has anyone been to Ephesus or Selchuk? Okay. So you'll be familiar with a lot of this, or at least uh, some of the pictures we're going to show uh, of some of the areas there. But uh, it's somewhat of a shadow of its former self, because back in Paul's day, it was the capital of Asia Minor's western region. It was known as a proconsular Asia, and of course it was under Roman rule at the time. And the population of Selchuk right now is 36,000 people. But back then, in Paul's day, in the first century, it was closer to 250,000 people. So it was a much bigger uh, area than it is now, and it was about 220,000 citizens and about 30,000 slaves. Ephesus was famous for the temple of Artemis, or Diana, as she was known in a Roman name. But great crowds of people were attracted to Ephesus because of the cult of Artemis and the famous temple that was there. And we have a picture of a rendering of the famous temple because there's not much left of it now. But this is what it would have looked like. <clears throat> it was made of solid marble. The dimensions of this monstrosity of a building was over 500 feet long, over 100 feet wide, so it covered an, over 91,000 square feet, which is like a two-acre building. And just in case you weren't sure if the temple had a bit of a presence in Ephesus, I mean, just look at it. It really would have been quite something to look at. 127 iconic columns that were 60 feet tall, decorated with ornate friezes, it was brilliantly gilded in gold and in silver. The altar was large enough to be able to sacrifice hundreds of animals simultaneously. And then during the feast days that honored Artemis, the population uh, of Ephesus would triple. It's kind of like when Taylor Swift comes to town. <laughs> the population triples. But also, a lot of wealth comes along with it. The economy of the city becomes blessed in many ways. And every year they would have this fe the, all these feast days honoring Artemis. The temple was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And as well as being a place where ritual, uh, religious rituals would take place, which obviously was its primary purpose, it also served as one of the largest banks of the ancient world. It was internationally recognized as a place of refuge. So anybody that needed protection, anybody that needed asylum could go to this temple but beyond that, it was also filled with some great works of art as well. So it was quite something. And this is relevant to our understanding of Paul's position because just as Paul had commented on the number of gods in, a, in Athens, because remember, two weeks ago I said he went to Athens, there were 30,000 gods, or there were considered to be 30,000 gods in Athens at the time for 10,000 people. Well, here in Ephesus, the emphasis is very much on the cult of Artemis or Diana. It was run exclusively by women. It was very much a religious center for that area at the time. And so we get into Acts 19, and the second half of Acts 19, uh, starting at verse 23. It says, About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. The sil a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in, uh, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus in, and in practically the whole province of Asia. Again, this is nice to hear that Paul is affecting such a large area. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Paul has been in Ephesus at this point for over two years, and he's been teaching the gospel of Christ, building the church of Ephesus, and apparently he was making some serious headway into, it, into this very religious city, religious based on Artemis mostly, and Ephesus is no different than the other places that Paul had been to on his journeys. He came across a lot of opposition. And just to skip back into the early parts of chapter 19 now, just to show you what kind of opposition it was, uh, it's, it came in the form of hardened hearts of the Jewish believers there. They ended up blaspheming the way. It says in verse 9, and some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe. They publicly maligned the way. Uh, and Paul's answer to that, 
was he left the synagogue. He went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this was a big public hall where both uh, Jewish people and Gentiles, the Greeks, could gather together. They would debate many issues. They would listen to philosophy. But now he had a much wider audience than he had before. The other type of thing that he came up against was a hypocrisy that came from these exorcists that were going around and using religion as a cloak to make themselves look so much better. Verses 13 through 16, it says, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who, uh, who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. But this, uh, you know, long term, this opposition ended up having a big effect because there was a great effect because the name of Jesus, Jesus was very much held in honor. There were sorcery scrolls that it talks about that were sacrificed and burned. There was the word of the Lord that spread and the word of the Lord became more and more powerful. And then when we get to the section we're looking at, verse 23, it says, and about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. Um, the way being the name for the church, the, modern, the name for the modern church. And the second half of this chapter is where we'll focus most of our attention. It switches gears a little bit. And now it starts off with Demetrius. He calls this meeting, Demetrius was a silversmith. He calls this meeting because he makes shrines to Artemis. And Paul was beginning to have an effect on his business. Not as many people wanted shrines to Artemis anymore because now they were following the way, the new church. Less people needed them. And so uh, these other craftsmen in the area were seeing the same effect. So he called them together and said, this fellow Paul is creating problems for us economically. And again, it's good for Paul, it's good for Paul to see because he really is making a difference, especially there in Ephesus. Everywhere he goes, though, he seems to end up upsetting people for various reasons. And this is economic. Um, the merchants, they were worried primarily about their own income. Remember in chapter 16 of Acts, we covered earlier on, in chapter 16 I talked about a slave girl who was possessed by evil spirits. It's, she had this supposed ability to tell fortunes or to fortune tell, and her owners were making money off her fortune telling uh, or supposed fortune telling. And then Paul, and she kept calling out Paul and his companions, calling them out, calling out, till finally Paul had enough and said, cast out the evil spirit, she was no longer uh, useful to the owners because she could no longer tell fortunes. So here again, Gentiles are upset with Paul because they're be beginning to lose their ability to earn income uh, in, from this false god in Ephesus. But it's interesting, in verse 27, if you look at this, the, the last part of what I just read, it said that there's a danger not only to our trade will lose its good name, but also to the temple of the great goddess Artemis who will be discredited and the goddess herself will be robbed of her divine majesty. The goddess herself will be robbed of her divine majesty. I'm glad that we serve a God whose majesty, whose sovereignty does not depend on us to feed it. Because the implication here is that Artemis will fade into insignificance if people stop worshipping her. And 2,000 years later, she has faded into insignificance because people stopped worshipping her. But our God, the God that we serve, is still as present today as he was back then and he will continue to be. But things escalated. Again, as we see in Acts, it's a constant thing. Everywhere Paul goes, things seem to escalate. And from their discussion about loss of income, now comes anger. And perhaps anger isn't a strong enough word, because in verse 26 it says, When they heard this, they were furious, and they began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. This could be described as hatred on the part of the silversmiths and the other merchants, which again led to inciting this mob towards violence. Then verse 29, says, then the whole city was in an uproar. Again, the, the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus and pe uh, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. All of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd and the disciples would not let him. Uh, but even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. This is the mob mentality. Half the people were in there going, well, I don't know, everyone was coming this way, so I thought I'd just tag along. What are we doing here? Is there a show? But uh, the Jews 
in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front. They shouted instructions to him, motion for si he motioned for silence in order to make the defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So if you're trying to conjure up in your mind this image of what all this looked like, this mayhem, first of all, again, there's been a situation where there's a mob gets together, they grab the nearest believers that they can find and take them, not this time to the authorities, but now they take them to the theater. And then not because they want to give, give them a show, but they take them to the theater. And this is a large open-air amphitheater. We have a picture of that as well. This is a modern-day picture. Uh, and if you've been there, you'll, you w would understand what this looks like. But it's huge. It's the largest public arena in the city. It was cut into the hillside facing the harbor, and it could accommodate 25,000 people seated and even more standing. So the Jews pushed Alexander to the front. Uh, and we're not quite sure who Alexander is. Luke mentions him, but he's not mentioned before, so it's not like we sort of oh, we refer back to this. We're not quite sure who he is. He's potentially uh, one of two things. He could either have been a known Christian, in which case they shove him up front and say, focus all your attention on him because we want to deflect from uh, the Jewish people here. Uh, but what seems more likely is that he was a leading Jewish person, someone that was trusted by the Jews there who said, okay, you go up and defuse this thing because you're a leader here. Um, and so the idea was that he would go up and defend it and say, you know, this Christian group, the, the, the way is not some sect of, of the Jewish faith. They have nothing to do with us. We have nothing to do with why this started. But he didn't really get much opportunity. He, he said it motioned for silence, so he probably put his hand up and they probably went silent, but then they realized that he was a Jew. So they didn't give him a lot of time to defend that. And so he basically uh, was yelled off the stage. And they began to shout for two hours, it says. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours. It must have been an extraordinary event. Just the crowd. That many people in that huge theater just shouting and shouting over and over again, chanting, uh, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And finally, verse 35, it says, The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, don't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our God, but goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. Uh, in that case, we would not be able to account for this connection or commotion since there is no reason for it. And after this was said, he dismissed, dismissed the assembly. So the city clerk was a very important person in the city government. And one of his responsibilities and in his role was to issue the decrees and to issue the commands that were reached by public assembly. And so for him to be able to silence a crowd, it wouldn't have been unusual for him. But this man shows incredible leadership in the face of some pretty uh, sort of passionate anger. There's no indication that he was a believer of Christ. There's no indication that he was a follower of Artemis, but it, that's more than likely. But maybe he was just a good politician. Because first of all, what he did was he connected with the men of Ephesus. He said, men of Ephesus. And then he emphasized to them by sort of stroking their ego and saying, the entire world knows that Ephesus is the guardian of the temple, the great Artemis. And at this point, he also reminded uh, that the, since the whole world knew, their, knew that, that there was a very important position for them to hold in the world, and they would be respected as such. But then he cleverly inserted a therefore. And he said, in order to indicate, if we are so revered in the world and honored in the world to have such a great responsibility, that therefore, we should, it should require some decorum. It should require some order. So this unnamed clerk saw the injustice against these two Christians, and despite any beliefs that he had, he, didn't, he wasn't going to allow that. But he told the mob that the men didn't, hadn't committed any crime, they hadn't done anything wrong at all. But his true message to the crowd that day really was, refined and respected citizens of Ephesus probably shouldn't be behaving like uncouth and uncivilized barbarians. 
What's more, his suggestion seems to imply that perhaps they were so refined and civil that perhaps if they had any legitimate legal concerns or problems, then they should take it up in the proper way. They should go to the local legal authorities. A riot is not an appropriate way to deal with legal matters. And he told them if they continued in this unrest, this civil unrest, and they themselves could be arrested for doing just that because they were under Roman rule ultimately. And the Romans did not like civil unrest. The Romans just wanted people to quietly pay their taxes and that's it, not cause any trouble. So they didn't like this kind of thing. So there was laws against it. So he was basically advising them that they'd be better off taking up due process with any of their issues with the courts. Chalk that one up for the city clerk. What was the result? Well, after making his case, he dismissed the crowd. And according to Acts 20, verse 1, uh, it says, when the uproar had ended. So it's, it's interesting to see God's grace alive and well, also in the lives of unbelievers, but also in the lives of unbelieving leaders like this city clerk. But it makes you wonder how many Christian leaders placed in a similar circumstance would have handled it quite as well. But there are some weighty lessons that we can learn from this historical snapshot of this anonymous clerk in Ephesus. But before I talk about idols, which is where I really want to go today, let's just talk quickly about one leadership lesson that we can learn from this city clerk. It's important to understand that the clerk didn't bend or change according to the will of the crowd, according to the pressure he was getting from the crowd, the mob's desires, uh, so that he could gain favor with them. He certainly didn't pander to the crowd that day. And uh, this can often be a personal failing for many of us. This idea of just kind of putting our finger up to the wind to see which way it's blowing. It's very tempting to just change our view according to the majority rule. Essentially, uh, it's especially bad if we dislike confrontation. We have much greater tendency to do that. But that's not leadership. That just becomes a fear of man more than we have a fear of God. And as soon as we begin to have a greater fear of what people think of us than what God knows of us, then we're on a slippery slope. The city clerk chose to do what was right, even in the face of potential opposition. But how many times as Christians have we backed down from a position, even if we know that it's a God-ordained position, because of pressure from the mob, or pressure from family, pressure from friends, groups? And don't get me wrong, no one should aim to die on every hill that comes along and take an inflexible stand for everything at the expense of all the relationships in their lives. But some principles, some convictions, some values that we have in life should be uncompromised, should be held onto at all times. As parents, often we bend to the will of our children because it just helps keep the peace. We've been entrusted to them or with them by God we are to shepherd them, and we generally know what's best for them, but sometimes mob mentality can take over, especially if you have a lot of kids on certain things. They gang up against you, <laughs> and that's okay in some circumstances. But still, there are things that when it comes to raising our kids that we shouldn't, or we don't, or we certainly shouldn't compromise on. We should stand firm, even in the face of a mob. God appointed leaders must exercise wisdom and courage in these types of situations. And if you think that the word leader excludes you from that particular thing, you think, well, I'm not a leader of anything. Well, everybody's a leader of something in some capacity, whether it's at your job or whether it's a family or whether it's a group of friends or whether it's your own life that you have to lead and, and uh, take on for yourself. But often we just think to ourselves, it's easier just to go along with the flow. Often it's also said it's true that all of us together are smarter than one of us. Many counselors or advisors is better than just one, but that's not always the case, as is shown in this episode in Ephesus. The city clerk here was able to apply wisdom. He was able to act on what he knew was to be right, and he showed the best leadership that he could. And in this election year, no, I'm not going to get political. But in this election year, we should watch how we react to mob mentality. And we should apply God's wisdom to the way that we decide to vote. Because at the end of the day, it's not about politics. What it is about is merely how we apply God's word to our lives and to apply God's word to everything around us. 
and how we apply what is right and what is wrong, irrespective of politics. God is not unclear about what is right and what is wrong. But an area that we can examine from the text also is this idea that as we become unleashed and on mission for God in our own lives, there will be occasions when we walk into dark places. Ephesus was a city of great wickedness. Many people had morals like animals there, even if the city clerk was trying to paint this picture of civility. That's what made him such a good politician. But it was certainly a place of spiritual darkness. This huge number of people that believed in this God. But fortunately, Paul was bringing the brightest light that he could, and that is the gospel of Christ. Paul saw this darkness as, a, uh, as an opportunity. It was very much a place of opportunity for, for him because he had the right philosophy about darkness and the opportunity it brings. Because when we think about opportunities, it's really about perspective. Many years ago, there were two salesmen who were sent by a British shoe manufacturer to Africa to investigate and report on the market potential in Africa. The first salesman reported back, there is no potential in Africa, nobody wears shoes. The second salesman reported back, there is massive potential here, nobody wears shoes. This is a sim simple illustration of how one thing can create either this view of hopelessness or this view of massive potential. And we Christians should be going into dark places but a lot of times Christians today don't want to be in those dark places. And we look for the nearest exit, wanting only to get out of there as quickly as possible. We may have this mentality of that there's so many lost people at my work, I just need to get out of there. But that's why God puts us there in the first place, because it's a dark place. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus in Matthew 5 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So it says, we are the light of the world. And what better place to put a light than in a dark place? If we walk into a dark room and flip the switch, do we just turn, away, turn around and abandon the idea of going into that room? It's like, well, the light doesn't work in here. I guess I'm not going in here. No, we go get a light bulb. We create light in there, and then it's not dark anymore. That being said, we should be careful about going into places that will drag us down or seek out places where we know that we will be tempted to do things that we shouldn't, but then God doesn't want us to be hermits either. We are to be in the world, just not of it. And God has placed us in the, at, at a door, a door of opportunity. The question is, do we walk through it? The darker the room the more our light will be seen. Our light doesn't stand out very much in this room, fortunately. Why? Because it's filled with other lights. Maybe it's a workplace, maybe it's a family gathering, maybe it's a specific event, but we need to walk through the door and just be different, be a light, something that opposes the darkness of this world, something that all eyes will focus on, seeing the light in our eyes will want to make them step into the light themselves. Paul, in this case, wanted to stay until Pentecost. Why? Because at that time, around May, was the Artemisian Games. And at that point, the whole Roman Empire descended upon this city. It was a great opportunity, and he saw it as a great opportunity. He didn't just think, oh, there's so many Romans coming, there's going to be a lot of danger, there's going to be a lot of disagreement, maybe more mobs. He just saw a great opportunity to be a light in stifling darkness. There was a youth director at Trinity Baptist Church in Jacksonville in Florida, Ron Riley. He began to take a small group of spiritually gifted young people to the beaches of Daytona during the Easter holidays for three days of witnessing. Witnessing during the infamous Daytona Beach spring break. If you're not familiar with it, I will tell you what it's about. But this project broadened to such, an appoint, such a point where young people from churches all across the country began to participate in it. And over the 43 years that they were doing this ministry, they reported that over 101,000 young people came to Christ. That's an average of over 2,300 per year just in that one spot at Daytona Beach. But just to give you an idea, there was 30, in its peak, there were 30 to 50,000 students going to Daytona Beach for spring break. 
It was famous for underage drinking, for public nudity, for drugs, for vandalism, for fights, and even you know, the rape of intoxicated young women. It was a dark place for sure. But Ron Riley and the young people he was discipling went about to change that. And the Spring Breakers had their own idols. They had their own Artemis, the pleasures of this world, even at the expense of others. We all have our own idols that we worship in some way. It can be something that we don't even think of as an idol. Anything that we put before our pursuit of God is an idol. Tim Keller, in his book, The Counterfeit God, said, an idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. So with that in mind, there are six primary idols that we as a culture spend a lot of time worshiping today. And I'm not saying it's just in here, it's everywhere. Culture as a whole. The first one is our identity. It's an idol, our identity. It's easy to place our identity in something or someone other than God. And currently, one way of obtaining identity is through social media following. How many people are following me? How many people are liking what I post? How many people are viewing what I put online? Or perhaps it's a position at work. How important am I at work? What is my abilities? What are my skills? What is my list of achievements in life or list of things that I would like to achieve? So not only is this an idol, it's a very difficult way to live. If our identity is wrapped up in our work, if it's wrapped up in our skills, our looks, or anything else, then we constantly feel like we're not measuring up. It's a very harsh master to serve. When our identity is rooted in God, when we consider ourselves a child of God, when we see ourselves as a disciple of Christ, it's then that we can finally live in freedom. Of course we will fall short, but God's love will never fail us. He will continue to love us. And that doesn't work for the other things that we might place our identity in. So we have to be careful not to put more value on on who we are in the world rather than in God. The second modern day idol is money or consumerism. Of course, this is not a modern day idol. This is an age old thing, but it still very much exists today. And if you don't Uh, This doesn't have any dependence upon whether you have lots of money or you don't have lots of money. It doesn't matter. It's this pursuit of money and the acquisition of things that becomes an idol for a lot of people in our culture. And it's in this uh, that we trust money or trust things more than we trust God. I'm not saying money is bad. Money is just a tool. But like any tool, we can use it in the right way or we can use it in the wrong way. And the wrong way with this can cause a lot of damage. Money itself isn't the problem, but how we use it and how we view it can become a problem. Many people place their hopes and dreams in money. Things will get better when I have more money. Problems will be over when I have more money. People will like me more when I have more money. It's a trust that provides for us. It's a trust that shows that it cares for us, that it protects us. The problem is it's an inanimate object. It's a tool. It cannot live up to what we are trying to get out of it. Money has become the ultimate thing for so many people in society. The fact is that money or the desire for money is driving people in our modern day culture to do things that were unthinkable years ago. You may have heard of or not, and I'm not going to ask who's heard of it because that will arouse some suspicious, but um, (laughs) you may have heard of the website OnlyFans. It's an internet, it went very quiet, it's an internet content subscription sort of site that people pay monthly. It's based out of London. Its site is primarily used for people who produce pornography. And I'm not saying professional photography. This is like everyday people that produce their own pornography, post it online. It could be people in your own neighborhoods. It also hosts work from other creators like musicians or from uh, people that do fitness experts or whatever, but that's a very small percentage of the people who post. The end of 2023, there were more than 3 million people uploading and posting content to this site. It was being viewed, in other words, subscribers of over 220 million people. In 2022, the revenue for OnlyFans was almost $1.1 billion. Some people, the subscribers, the, not the subscribers, the people who post, the content creators, they can earn a few hundred dollars a month. Others earn millions a month from uploading. It's mind-blowing. 
Firstly, the equivalent of two-thirds of the United States population is subscribing to a service like this every single month. Uh, but mostly, it's the three million people that are now putting uh, money as such a high priority in their lives that they decide that posting sexual content of themselves online is okay and acceptable. I use this as an example because this particular company or this website gets commonly cited in the business press as being an example of one of the fastest growing companies in, in the world. You can see from this that the desire for more and more money will drive us as a culture to do things that would have been unthinkable in the past. It's a motivating factor in our life. That, uh, if, our, if our motivating factor in life is money and not God, then it's an idol. The third one is entertainment. In our culture now, we are obsessed with entertainment, and it comes in a lot of forms. It could be Netflix to vacations, it could be video games to podcasts. We love all kinds of entertainment. And again, as with money, it's not entertainment that's bad. It can be a very good thing. But when our lives become about this constant search for entertainment all day, every day, chasing the best experiences that we can find, then it becomes an idol. It becomes more important than God. I'd argue that entertainment is good and it's a gift from God, but we should worship the giver, not the gift. The fourth thing is sex. We're obsessed with sex in our culture. It's everywhere. It might be the only thing that we think about more than money. We've taken this gift from God and made it into a God of our own lives. And for many, their lives are controlled by sex. Sex addicts, pornography, things like that. To even question the sexual ethics in our society now brings on an onslaught of accusations, which actually shows us how tied to this idol we really are. Our sexual identity, sexual practices, sex lives have become so sacred to us. Just consider 220 subscribers to OnlyFans every single month, or 220 million. So for many today, sex is an idol. We value it more than we value God. The fifth one is comfort. And this sounds like an odd idol, comfort. What could be wrong with comfort? Well, there's an endless list of products that promise to simplify and add comfort to our lives. We have made our lives so much easier. We've made our lives so much more comfortable than any other time in history. Uh, tasks that used to take all day now can take a matter of minutes. Many menial tasks are now automated, and that's a good thing. That frees up our time for other things. But our pursuit should not be comfort alone. Jesus tells a very different narrative for his followers. He says uh, that his followers will face trial, they'll face persecution, they'll face, face difficulty. And while comfort isn't bad, it can be very damaging if it becomes the main pursuit in life. All I want to do is be comfortable. I do not want to do anything else except be comfortable. And when comfort is an idol, uh, then we will struggle when God calls us to something difficult. And then the last one, of course, is our phones. Can talk about idols without talking about phones, right? The smartphone addiction is increasingly a worrying trend. It's especially true for the Gen Z and the millennial generations, but it is certainly not confined to them. For so many of us, we simply cannot exist without our phones or at least some kind of online presence. This is quickly becoming an idol for many people. The problem isn't the phones, the problem isn't social media or any form of technology, it's the value that we place on it that makes it a problem. When our life revolves around how many likes we get, how many followers we get, or if we cannot sit in silence for five minutes without refreshing a news feed, then we might have an idol. Anything that takes the place of God in our life, anything that becomes more important to him, takes time away from what we could be doing to serve in his kingdom or to study his word, is an idol. It's easy to look back at the days of Paul and say, well, yes, he went to Athens. They had 30,000 gods there, and he was in uh, Ephesus, and they had the temple dedicated to Artemis, two acres of temple. I think, well, yeah, they had idols. They used to sell idols in the marketplace. As Paul continued his journey, he came across different cultures with different idols, which he had to overcome in order for them to hear the message of the gospel. They wouldn't listen until they could let go of the idols that they had in their lives. And as we become unleashed on God's mission, we also have to displace modern day idols in order for others to hear our message. And this won't always be easy. 
Sometimes there will be a mob that will form against us. There will be a group of people who don't want us to say what we need to say, but we have to keep pushing, and we have to keep the light lit in the darkest of areas and not be afraid to take the light into the darkest of areas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the words of Luke, the example of Paul and his travels along with him, that they were not afraid to go into the darkest of places. So Lord, help us to see the dark places in our culture, the dark places in our society where we can be a light. But also, Lord, help us to protect ourselves against the idols that we can have in our lives because that will bring us down, that will distract us from the, from the mission that you have for us. So Lord, help us to have discernment in what we do, the discipline in what we do, to be able to stay on track. Yes, enjoy some of the good things of this life, but also primarily to be focusing on you and to be focusing on your message, and to be focusing on the work that we need to do in your kingdom. We love you, Lord, and we just pray that we can not look to self, but to look to you constantly, to not be guided by crowds, but to be guided by your light. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. All right. So we're in Acts 20, 21, and we're going to be a little bit all over the place a bit today. Um, I think my mind was a little all over the place when I was writing this week. But uh, anyway, essentially, we're going to start in Acts 20. Uh, we've been we're wrapping up this sermon series called The Second Missionary Journey of Paul. But uh, the reality is that we're now really firmly in the third missionary journey of Paul. We've kind of bled into that. But really, uh, we're looking at his travels, we're looking at what, uh, the fact that he went to a lot of different places. Him and his companions, they traveled from place to place to place. Obviously, it took quite a while because things take time, but as we read it in Acts, it kind of feels like it's happening so quickly. But, uh, so that, that's kind of what we're trying to get to in this idea of studying his missionary journeys as he went from place to place and place, and then he would go back to different places as well to kind of follow up with the churches that he planted, the gospel that he planted there to make sure that things were going the right way. So at the beginning of chapter 20 of Acts, it quickly jumps through much of the journey in this third journey. And uh, it states that all of those that were accompanying Paul went along with him. It kind of lists these people that were with him at the time, at the beginning of chapter 1, I mean chapter 20. And then um, before we get to the passage that I primarily want to focus on today, uh, I want to look at verse 6, where it says that they ended up in Troas. So they were in Troas, and now we're going to look at a story in verse 7 through 12, a story that really isn't spoken about too much, um, but I want to cover that. It's often overlooked, and I want to cover that quickly this morning. So verse 7 of chapter 20 says, On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread, and Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There are many lamps in the upstairs room where, he, where we were meeting. Seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, he left, and the people took the young man home alive and were greatly, greatly comforted. So it's, it's not hard to find just a little humor in this story, even though it's quite a serious story at the end of the day. But uh, Paul was leaving Troas the next day, but he had so much that he wanted to say to the people there that he just started talking and talking, and then he went on till midnight, uh, and then... That was just for starters. And then the young man called Eutychus at that point was sitting in one of the window spaces. Remember, there's not glass windows or anything there. These are wide open window spaces in the upstairs, the upper rooms of these houses. They would have larger space to let the breeze in to cool the rooms. But uh, he was reclining in that space uh, and three stories up, he fell asleep and fell to the ground from there and he died. And I have no doubt that it wasn't because Paul was boring him literally to death, but it says that Paul was going on and on. And the implication here is that he's not droning on and on, it's just he has a lot to say. So there was one thing after another after another because he was trying to pack it all in before he had to depart from Troas. 
But it was late, and this man was not seated in the safest of places, so he was beginning to drop off and literally dropped off. So Paul's reaction to that was he ran down there, threw himself onto this man, he, he put his arms around him, and he said to the crowd, don't worry, he's alive. Now, some scholars suggest that perhaps the, the, he, that meant, don't worry, he never died in the first place. That don't worry, he's alive, he's not dead. Uh, some say it was Paul kind of rousing him by jumping on him, rousing him from being dead. It's kind of an early version of CPR. <laughs> or perhaps, to quote the great movie, The Princess Bride, he was only mostly dead. <laughs> but that was for you. <laughs> but Luke wrote wrote here that he was dead. Luke wrote here. Luke was a physician, so we can assume that he knew the difference between someone being alive and being dead. And we, we got to notice also in this that the pronouns have changed again, because earlier on when we were talking in Acts, and we noted that when Luke, the writer of Acts, joined them, it became we and us. So he was writing in the first person there instead of in the third person when he was talking about Paul doing other things. Now we're back into the first person again, and Luke, so, so Luke was there. He was witnessing this firsthand. Uh, this wasn't from other witnesses. So it's highly unlikely that he would write that he was dead unless he was sure of it. Firstly, because he was a physician, but also because the implications of that are huge. Because if the man was dead, then Paul literally raised him from the dead. It's like Peter raised Dorcas or Tabitha, as she was also called, from the dead in Acts 9. So like that, now Paul had performed a miracle. So this wasn't something that, that Luke would write about lightly because this was something uh, very, very important. But afterwards, Paul ate. Uh, he went back to teaching until the sun came up. He had that much to say. So Luke then comments, reiterates the young man was alive, the young man was well, but he also said the people there were greatly comforted. And that's important. They were comforted because, it's, uh, firstly, they was an experience they would never, ever forget seeing somebody die and then being raised from the dead, but also it would have become a central part of Paul's message as he preached the gospel in Troas. It would be something that would really reiterate the power of Jesus Christ through Paul. Troas isn't mentioned too many other times. It was mentioned earlier on when Paul had a vision that he needed to go to Macedonia. Uh, that was in chapter 6 of Acts. Uh, also, it's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, where Paul mentions to Timothy to bring his cloak and to bring his scrolls and his parchments that he had left in Troas with Carpus. But uh, considering this story is one of a miraculous raising from the dead, it's one that does not get talked about very much in general. But really, I want to look this morning at what happens after this. And Paul went from Troas, he went to Assos, which is about a 20-mile walk, and then he went beyond that. So verse 13 of chapter 20 says, And he went, uh, we went ahead on the, uh, to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made arrangements for this because he was going there on foot. When we met him at Assos, we took him aboard and we went to Metilene. We weren't told why Paul chose to walk, it's very possible that there were people in Troas that wanted to spend more time with him, wanted to discuss the gospel more with him. They wanted to ask more questions. So he said, well, I'm going to walk. So if you would like to walk along with me, then we can continue our discussions while I'm on the way. Or maybe it's just that he wanted a, a long, one last journey by foot before he was confined to a ship for a period of time, just to have a walk before he got on the ship. But they continued, verse 15, it says, The next day we set sail from there, we arrived, Dos Caius, uh, and the day after we crossed over to Samos, on the same, and then on the following day we arrived at Miletus. Uh, they did not stop in Ephesus, and Luke makes a point of saying this in verse 16. It says, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. So he had a timeline in mind here. He'd been directed by the Holy Spirit uh, that he needed to head to Jerusalem. He wanted to get there before Pentecost because Pentecost was a great day of celebration, especially for the early church. It was a celebration of the time when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples after the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Uh, it's also a fact that Jerusalem would have been packed, not because of 
the, the early church celebration, but because it was a Jewish, Jewish feast that was called the Feast of Harvest or the Feast of Weeks that would have been going on at the same time of Pentecost. And so Paul always saw these things as an opportunity. When a place is packed, Paul gets the opportunity to speak to more people than if it wasn't. So Paul wanted to make it there for Pentecost. So he decided he would skirt around Ephesus but so he wouldn't be delayed. His experience in Ephesus, I mean, he was spent years there teaching, but his last experience in Ephesus, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the riot there, and so he didn't want to get delayed by things like that. Uh, however, he did have close friends in the church, in the Ephesian church there, so he wanted to spend some time with them. And so in verse 17, it says, From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you from the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus." So he's in Miletus, it's 36 miles south of where Ephesus was, and he asked the elders to come and meet him so he didn't get delayed in Ephesus. So they came the 36 miles, and they met with him, and it's, almost, it's like he's giving his farewell speech to these men. Well, he is giving his farewell speech to these men, because Paul knows that this time when he's going into Jerusalem, that he got this sense that it's going to be more than just these brief arrests or this trouble that he's had uh, and the persecution that he's already seen. Because in verse 22 he says, And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of, you, none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So he knows that this is the final time that he's going to be spending with these elders of the Ephesian church. He knows that he's laid down a solid foundation there. He's put these men in place. He knows that there's some, some good solid teaching going on. He knows that there's wisdom there. The, and he's offering his final piece of wisdom for them, which he backs up later in a letter when he, write, when he writes it from imprisonment in Rome, the letter, the epistle of the, to the Ephesian church. But his sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, which we've talked about in this series before, the fact that he was being directed by the Holy Spirit and nudged him by the Spirit, is now sending him to Jerusalem. And he's very aware that everywhere he goes, he finds some kind of persecution. But there's a sense in his words here that uh, he knows there's going to be more than that. He says his only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that Jesus gave him. There's an awareness that he knew what he was walking into this time. Uh, and then in the next chapter of Acts, Paul is arrested fairly quickly. And frankly, his arrest by the Romans saved his life. Because he was in Jerusalem, he's with his companions. Somebody from Asia, one of the Jewish people from Asia, recognized one of his companions and in turn recognized him. And then they, they basically decided to, to grab him. They pulled him from the temple, took him outside of the temple, uh, in order to kill him, because they would defile the temple if they killed him in the temple, so they dragged him outside the temple, because it's okay to kill him outside the temple. I don't know. Um, but anyway, the Roman soldiers intervened, arrested him, put him in chains, and frankly, saved his life. In Acts 21, verses 30, 35 through 36, it says, when Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. So this really has escalated very quickly and now to a whole new level that Paul probably hasn't quite experienced in the same way. But it was started from Jews that came from Asia, suspected they came from Ephesus. So as we look at this theme this year, this idea of being unleashed and on mission for Christ, and Paul is showing us how we must continue, how we must carry on, even if we know that we are moving into more uncomfortable or difficult circumstances. And he's not only modeling this, he's also encouraging the elders of the Ephesian church to do exactly the same thing. 
But the nearer that Paul traveled to Jerusalem, the more he began to understand what was going to happen and what lay ahead. Because in Acts 21 verse 10, it says, after we'd been there for a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owners of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up. The Lord's will be done, he said. Agabus, who was a prophet, came from Judea. He shows physically, using Paul's belt on his own wrists and his own uh, ankles, the fact that Paul would be taken and bound. It was kind of an object lesson. He would be bound and handed over to the Gentiles, in this case, the Romans. And Paul's companions pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul's response to this was a powerful message, not just to the people there, but all Christians then and now and into the future. And for many, it's been a reality. But he said, I am ready to be bound. I am ready to die for Jesus. He knows that when God allows him to finally take his life, then his work will finally be complete. But he goes to Jerusalem nevertheless. Carry on. While there's still breath in his lungs, there's still work to be done. And so he's showing through his example and his actions that we are directed and called by the Spirit, and we must carry on, continue down the path, no matter where it takes us, no matter what circumstances it puts us in. And he was also urging the elders of the church to carry on as well, because in chapter, back to chapter 20, verse 29, it says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Be on your guard. You see, he wasn't saying this to discourage the elders, saying things are going to go horribly wrong, that wolves are going to come into the flock, the gospel's going to get distorted, um, and even some of your own disciples will do the same thing. Uh, but he wasn't saying that to discourage them, but he was giving them a warning that it was going to happen because often when we're on a path that we're on and then things start going badly, things start going wrong, things get tainted, sometimes we just decide, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. It's just too difficult. I'm going to give up. Everything I try doesn't work, doesn't go right. But Paul doesn't want this to happen to the Ephesian church. He's put a lot of investment into this church. So he's just forewarning them because being forewarned is being forearmed. Now they can be aware that this is going to happen. It doesn't change what will happen, but it means that when it does, they'll be able to work through it much more efficiently and be much more aware of it. In other words, carry on despite it all. Jesus gave us a similar warning in our faith. He didn't say that we would skate through life with ease. And if we, and that if we believe him and we commit our lives to him, things would get easy and go smoothly. He never said that. He said the opposite. He said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He's just forewarning us so that we can be forearmed. When things do happen, when things go awry, we have to be prepared and, that the, and have this knowledge that the valleys of life will come. But despite the fact that we look at this comment by Jesus, we might find, because you could look at it and say, well, that seems like we should despair a little. We don't get this get out of jail free card when we become a Christian. Things don't just go suddenly magically well. It could be discouraging for people, but in the same sentence, he reminds us he's overcome the world. And even though trouble comes, it, it never gets the final say. Even the worst trouble that finds our way into life, perhaps even death, will not end up being a bad situation because even in death we find ourselves in the presence of Jesus Christ himself. And this is what should allow us to carry on and to push forward. It's not that Jesus is asking us to do something he hasn't already done. This is Palm Sunday. I, just as a sidetrack, I do remember the first Palm Sunday that I spent here before I was a believer, the first Palm Sunday, I came to New Hope and I was sitting somewhere over there and Pastor Tim started off by saying, I don't like Palm Sunday. And I, I thought, well, that's interesting. 
I'd never heard anybody say that before, especially in front of a church. But then, of course, I hadn't listened to many pastors before, and I hadn't I'd just heard some Anglican, preach, Anglican priests, and I'm not sure they like very much. But, um, but he said, I don't like Palm Sunday. And I thought to myself, well, that, that's not a good start for a sermon. But he went on to explain that the reason that he didn't like Palm Sunday is because just as Jesus entered into Jerusalem and the people made this a very triumphant en entry into Jerusalem, they were waving palm leaves, they were celebrating by shouting Hosanna, and yet only a few days later the very same people are yelling crucify him. Because it's truly a picture of human nature and it's not a good picture. We talked the other week about this, this idea of mob mentality this idea that this mob formed against Paul in Ephesus in the church. They, they dragged anyone they could find from the early church there into this huge amphitheater in Ephesus. And Luke wrote about the crowd. He described the crowd. He said, the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. This was the element of the, the welcome that Jesus received as he entered into the city of Jerusalem. In Matthew 21, it's described, it says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in, G in Galilee. So they were stirred by the excitement, but they didn't know who he was. They didn't know why they were there. And we can quickly become like that. We have to be careful not to get wrapped up in the excitement of things and just carried along in this mob mentality, not even knowing what we're getting into, because it can work uh, for the bad side or the good side, because it's easy on the bad side, just especially when we're younger, just to become part of one of the crowd, to do something just because everybody's doing it. And it's usually not something that's healthy for us. It's not usually healthy physically or certainly not spiritually or mentally, but... It may not be something that's good for us, but everybody is doing it. Remember the parental expression. What if everyone's jumping off a cliff? Would you go jump off the cliff? For some reason, that one always comes up. But it's this mob mentality in people. Um, and it, not just in bad things. It also happens in good things as well. Sometimes when kids go to camp, Christian camp, they come back with this sort of mindset of a believer, which is great news. We've spent a week immersed in the Christian faith with worship, with small, dis small group discussions, dis study of the word, listening to great speakers and teachers. Everybody is on board. They all get back. They embrace this. Nothing wrong with that because it certainly has changed so many people's lives, Christian camps, and the camp acceptance of Christ is a very common way to begin a walk with Christ. But sometimes we get this feeling that when they get back, there's a result of what everyone was doing it. I just went along with it. And the reality is that when they get back to their routine, their everyday life, it begins to fade. And soon it's like it never happened at all. And actually this shows up the immense importance of following up with people once they get off the mission field, once they come back from camps, once they get, once they get back from these immersive experiences in the Christian faith. It's so important to follow up with people to make sure that what they have experienced there can translate into experiencing it in everyday life as well. Because too quickly... It can be, it begin to fade. It's not a very popular thing to talk about, but it's the reality of us as people. We can get wrapped up in things, this mob mentality. But once we're separated from the environment, it can fade. There was a lot of celebration as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Much of it was fueled by others being wrapped up as being part of the crowd, but not really understanding why they were there. Equally, later on in the week, as there was cries for Jesus' crucifixion. In John 19, we also see, it says here, when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. It wasn't the crowd, not the beginning. It was the chief priests and their officials. And then in Mark 15, it's written, but the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have Pilate released uh, Barabbas instead. So there was the chief priests and the officials there that were stirring up the crowd, getting them all worked up. The same people that were getting all stirred up at the beginning when he came into Jerusalem. So he play, they played on human nature to be able to fit in, to be part of the crowd, not against anybody else. Who wants to be the lone voice in a big crowd? So as we see the excitement of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, we also see the same mentality play out against Jesus later on in the week. 
I'm sure you're thinking, well, that's nice, but what does it have to do with Paul? But, well, Paul knew that he needed to go into Jerusalem. And not only had the Holy Spirit been given him a sense of what would happen there, but now he had a prophecy that he would be bound and handed over to the Gentiles. Jesus knew also that he needed to go to Jerusalem, and it was time, and he knew what his fate would be in Jerusalem. Matthew 20 says, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus was very aware of what was going to happen to him when he arrived in Jerusalem. He would be arrested and handed over to the Gentiles and executed. Paul was very aware now of what would happen to him when he arrived in Jerusalem. He would be arrested, he'd be handed over to the Gentiles, and eventually, even though it took years, he would be executed. But they both went anyway. Because they were called to go. Jesus' life, Jesus' death had a purpose for us. God the Father called him to die for us, to die for our sins. Paul needed to go back to Jerusalem. He needed to be arrested and taken to Rome because this was the opportunity for Paul to stand in front of the most powerful people of his time and to preach the gospel of Christ, to preach to the Gentiles in Rome because this was the seat of the power in Paul's time. And as our lives as believers, I think we have two journeys that we should follow. Two important journeys to follow as believers. The first is our journey and our calling. This journey means, first of all, that we need to determine what our calling is. It's hard to go on a trip unless you know exactly where you're going. But it comes back to this need to figure out where God is calling us to. And it's done in various ways. And we've talked about this over the last year or so. But this idea that, first of all, the very first thing is we should take inventory, take stock of ourselves. We should find out what our gifts and our our skills and our passions are. And combined with an awareness of the Holy Spirit's guiding, the, the Holy Spirit's prompting in our lives, then we will find the direction that we should be heading on this journey. As we can see illustrated by Jesus and then by Paul later on, sometimes we know that following the direction of the Lord will end up with us not in the most desirable and not in the most comfortable situations. And when we have this knowledge, it becomes much more difficult to go because we like to be comfortable, we like to be cozy, we like to serve the Lord in comfort. But sometimes we are called for something different, even if it's just for a short season. And it's then that we have to dig deep in our faith. We have to understand that when the Lord calls us, he also gives us the strength to do it. It may not be our ideal, but it's his desire for us. It may also mean that we have to turn our minds onto this expression, carry on. Carry on, my good and faithful servant. We are called to be relentless in our faith. We are called to be sacrificial in our faith. And we are called to be obedient in our faith, to put aside our own desires, to put aside our own comfort, to put aside our own agendas. And it's hard to do that, there's no doubt. And those that don't have a faith in Christ may look at this and wonder why anybody would want to follow Jesus if that was the expectation. But it's not one-sided. It's not just God telling us to sacrifice and do whatever he tells us to do, no matter how difficult it makes our lives. He will bless us in what we do. He will, we will find joy in him. And then we will find that he provides for us. He provides for us physically, he provides for us mentally, and certainly spiritually. And we will be fed by this hope that we will have eternal life with him. And that provides for us an amazing peace that you cannot find from any other knowledge. We realize at that point that Jesus is all-sufficient. We don't need anything else. He'll provide everything else, but he is all sufficient in our lives. But we must carry on. Carry on as good and faithful servants. The second journey we need to follow is the journey forward towards death. That sounds dark. That sounds ominous. But it's not quite what I mean. Death does provide us the very presence of Christ himself. There's no doubt about that. But what I mean is we, as we go on this journey, we need to die to self. We, we become disciples of Christ. We become followers of Christ. 
And this is probably the first thing. Before the first journey I mentioned, this is the first thing we need to do, because unless you die to self first, there's no way you can go on the next journey. But as we become disciples of Christ, the world will constantly nip at our heels. It will try to pull us away from the pathway that we're, that's making us more holy or more righteous. And so one journey that we need to take as we're on mission for the Lord is that we need to die to self. And that's the first step. Before we can truly follow his calling, we must first take this step. And that's also a very difficult thing to do. In Luke 9, 23 through 24, it records how Jesus tells us to do this. He said, then we will, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. So what does dying to self mean? It means turning our back on our old selves. It means turning our back on old ways, on sinful ways, looking to the cross, finding new purpose and finding true transformation in our lives. Romans 2.12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. This journey of dying to self being transformed by the Spirit, helps us to test and approve what God's will is for us. Once we do that, his will becomes much more clear. Paul also talks about living for things of this world, living for the worldly pleasures only, worldly endeavors. In Romans 8, he says, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Jesus in his his ministry used some other illustrations to help us to understand uh, this radical transformation that we have to make in our lives by following him. Uh, I quoted one earlier, just pick up the cross daily, but he reiterates that later on in Luke, but he adds more. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and child, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's very strong language. Hate your father, your mother, and really it just means by that it's like any, compared to the relationship that we should have with Jesus, anything else looks like hate. Because it should be that passionate and that radical in our lives. Another time in Mark, we read about a young man who approached him and said, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And he was a rich man. And he said, you've got to go sell everything that you own and give it to the poor. That's how you can become my disciple. Of course, he left feeling very crestfallen. But uh, the disciples also were called to be with him, to give up their careers, to be in ministry with Jesus. And it wasn't just for the time period that Jesus was teaching. Then they became leaders of the early church. Then they ended up sacrificing their lives for Jesus. Uh, And with these type of expectations, it's a wonder that anyone became a follower of this obscure Jewish teacher back then. But we now have the luxury of seeing how the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus played out. We can read about his entry into Jerusalem, about his arrest, about his torture, about his crucifixion, but more importantly about his resurrection and see what that means to us now. We can see how Paul's return to Jerusalem meant that it it led to him being transported to Rome. And although it's not recorded in the Bible, we have to assume that he stood before Caesar who was Nero at the time, that he stood in front of Caesar. He pleaded his case, but he also got the opportunity to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel to the most powerful man in the world at that time. And we can assume that he preached it because in Acts 27, Luke writes that uh, as Paul was being shipwrecked in Malta, it says, uh, Paul said, last night an angel of God uh, to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand trial before Caesar. And if it was promised by God, it would come about. But the result of Paul carrying on, going to Jerusalem, being arrested, he ended up preaching in front of King Agrippa and Emperor Nero, amongst others of great influence, because that was his calling. He was successful on his journey to die to to self. He wasn't perfect. No one's perfect. We can never be perfect, but we should constantly strive to be as close as possible to holy and righteous as we can. 
But the result of Jesus carrying on into Jerusalem was the fulfillment of the prophecies about his life and about his death. He provided for us an example of huma- in humanity of what it is to serve and to sacrifice. Sometimes we need incentive to die to self, to not move backwards anymore. Sometimes we have to find ways to push forward instead of go back. So I want to close with one of my favorite stories. It's set in April, and it was April of 1519. There was a Spanish explorer called Hernando, or Hernan Cortez. He sailed into the harbor of Veracruz in Mexico, and he brought with him only about 600 men. And over the next two years, he was vastly outnumbered uh, and by the forces uh, that they were fighting, but he did defeat Montezuma and all the warriors of the Aztec Empire, and it made him the conqueror of all Mexico. But how did he accomplish this amazing feat when two prior expeditions couldn't even establish a colony in Mexico at the time? Because Cortes knew from the very beginning that he and his men faced an incredible, uh, faced incredible odds. He knew that the road before them was very difficult, it was very dangerous, and he knew that his men would be tempted to just give up and go back to Spain. And so as soon as Cortes and his main men came ashore, as soon as they unloaded all their provisions, he ordered the entire fleet of 11 ships destroyed and sunk. His men stood on the shore and they watched as their only possibility of retreat sunk into the ocean. From that point on, they knew uh, from, without any doubt that there was no turning back. Nothing lay between them and home except an empty ocean. They had two options. They could conquer or they could die. When Elisha, in the Bible, burned his plow, killed his oxen, he did the same thing. He stepped out of his old life into a new one with the hope and faith uh, and is uh, firmly fixed on God. And as we transform our lives, we need to step out of our old lives, move forward. And sometimes it's good to make sure that there's no way to go back, to burn our ships, to burn our plows. Sometimes it's good to burn our bridges. But carry on, nevertheless, and carry on into our Jerusalem and do whatever the Lord has in store for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the example of Paul, that he carried on, no no matter what the odds were, he knew what he was walking into. He knew what the outcome would be, and he knew that he needed to do it anyway. So Lord, give us that strength, give us that boldness that Paul had. But also, Lord, we're so grateful for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, because he knew what he was walking into. He knew what he was about to have, the kind of week he was about to have, and yet he did it anyway. In his humanity, he showed us what it is to lead and and to sacrifice. Lord, we love you, so we just ask for the same boldness as them. That when we see your calling in our lives, when we see that it will take us into different places, places that we might not want to go, that we will go anyway and we will carry on. Because it is our calling and it is your desire. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.